Sergey for giving the chance to be here. Yeah. That's Stefan. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> and all of you for coming. Uh, well, uh, yes, one could argue that there are two parallel technology evolutions going on. Uh, one in quantum, one in uh, AI. So actually, in this lecture, in, uh, largely in a lecture given by my uh, beloved wife and my colleague, uh, Sasha Baldasil, tomorrow. We will try to show how these queries actually could benefit from each other. 
And here, what I'd like to cover today, and uh, I guess the key points are any new technology needs its material platform. And uh, we were quite happy recently to discover that silicon nitride, which is uh, a material of choice for, let's say, for uh, classical nanophotonics, we were able to show that under certain conditions, you could actually create beautiful uh, single photon sources, which is absolutely in the heart of quantum applications. Uh, message number two is related to the uh, field where I have been working quite for a while, uh, metamaterials, plasmonic metamaterials. And I will try to show that actually plasmonic metamaterials, in my humble opinion, actually could make a difference for quantum. And the reason behind this is uh, so-called Purcell effect. By the way, Purcell was a graduate of the same school where I have privilege to teach uh, from Purdue University. And uh, because plasmonics enables confinement in exceptionally small volumes, uh, which could be in size like five nanometers, you have dramatic speed up in the rate with which uh, processes operate. And by doing so, you could make quantum processes faster than decoherence, which is a stumbling block for most of quantum applications, so that they would become immune to decoherence because they would just, they simply operate faster. That's a simple, but uh, I believe quite powerful idea. And finally, I'll show, yes, indeed, because in quantum, we have to deal with exceptionally small signals. Uh, and if you're serious about quantum photonic circuitry, you have to have like millions of sources and uh, make them play an important game. You cannot simply process information when you're dealing with such a small signals without uh, machine learning. And indeed, machine learning uh, could make a difference in that regard. So this is kind of propaganda slide, if you wish, it shows uh, how speed with which we process, process information, or more specifically, calculations per second, per hundred dollars, evolved with time uh, with different technologies, starting with analytical engine and going to nowadays uh, uh, non-electronics-based computers. Uh, but the next progress, I guess nobody would argue these days, is related to optics or quantum or both. Well, in optics, of course, we have much bigger operational band, everything operates faster, but quantum brings this uh, unique broadening of information space through the pendulum. So if you could bring them together, that uh, could be particularly beneficial, and that's one of the hope behind quantum computing. Okay, so let's start with uh, this uh, slide, which overviews uh, numerous efforts in terms of coming up with platform and again, I emphasize how it's important uh, for quantum in this particular case. And there is no obvious winner. Clearly, there is a trade-off uh, between the interaction strength, where superconducting qubit seems uh, to uh, have a superior performance, and coherence side, where photons, of course, are beatable. So there are all uh, different materials and platforms in between based on uh, trapped atoms, trapped ions, uh, all type of defects in solids. And depending on applications, probably all of this would find uh, their specific uh, niche. So, but one thing we could be sure about, at least I'm certainly one of, of those believers, that uh, photonics will indeed play very central role. And the simple idea behind this, these photons will package information into a signal of zero mass and propagate it with the ultimate speed, which is speed of light. And therefore, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that perhaps the most spectacular applications in the area of quantum so far, at least to my taste, uh, one way or another based on photonics. And I illustrate just a couple of them. One is this uh, optics space. Uh, quantum communication through satellite, done this by the Chinese group, and the uh, distance is pretty amazing, uh, 4600 kilometers. And another one is quantum simulator. They call it computers, but strictly speaking, it's specifically designed for one particular problem, boson sampling. And this is just a few weeks old, and it's done by uh, Zamadu company, and they do this problem with a 36 microsecond and the best available classical computer, which is in Oak Ridge National Lab, it would take 9,000 years to do the same problem. So uh, 
I would argue there are only two so far uh, quantum supremacy demonstrations which uh, everybody would uh, agree, and both are based on photonics. So uh, at this point, I probably would be very speculative if it's just my opinion, and I might be uh, turned out to be wrong in this. But um, when it comes down to quantum applications, quantum computing is uh, probably the most lucrative one. And uh, quantum photonic computing is different from other approaches, such as superconductor based or uh, Rydberg Adams based, in, uh, in, in, in the following regard. In this case, the photonic quantum computers use so called one way computing. Uh, and they don't need really gating. So the role of gating is played by this uh, single photon coincidence measurement. And that's a big advantage by itself, but even bigger perhaps advantage is the fact that we should realize that the way it looks now, to run any quantum algorithm requires by far more qubits to deal with error correction than the number of qubits needed to run the algorithm itself. So error correction is indeed uh, the most challenging problem when it comes down to quantum computing. And with photonics, the error rate is five orders of magnitude less. And that's a big winning point. Therefore, at least in the near future, I would argue photonic quantum computers might win. It's harder to say in longer term, of course, the biggest advantage when you have real qubits, real gates, and, uh, but at least in the near term. And therefore, it's not surprising that a company like Cyclone to Manzana do show quite a lot of it, uh, success and demonstrate this quantum supremacy. <laughs> and in the heart of photonic quantum computers, uh, you have to have these sources of single photons. Uh, but they are prone to decoherence, so you need to, uh, to resolve this problem. The way they approach now, they uh, use this uh, uh, parametric down conver uh, conversion, uh, 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 down conversion, which is a probabilistic process. Uh, which in dramatically increases actually the overhead infrastructure and also error rate. So it would be indeed great to have sources, deterministic sources, as opposed to probabilistic sources of uh, single photon sources. And uh, we, I just outlined a couple of approaches to realize them. Uh, of course, it's probably not the only ones, but at least that's what we pursue and I have big hopes for. One is based on this. Uh, uh, silicon nitride based uh, single uh, photon sources, which I already advertised, and I will speak of this uh, more. And another one is combine them with plasmonic speed up, which I also mentioned. Because typical decoherence rate is in the range of picosecond or even sub picosecond time. Typical rate of uh, with which photons are emission, spontaneous emission, is nanosecond. So you need to speed up the process by three to four orders of magnitude to make it able to decoherence. And for that, as I pointed out, plasmonics might be a really unique uh, tool to use. So let me start with the silicon nitride-based single photon sources. It came a little bit like a surprise to us, but sometimes when you work hard for a long time, these surprises do come. So what, uh, it's well known that in silicon nitride, there's very strong fluorescence background, and nobody sees any single photon sources. Uh, by the way, I'm speaking now about room temperature. So what we did, we used a slightly different way to make this uh, silicon nitride. Specifically, we used high-density plasma CVD. And very importantly, we used very rapid annealing. And later, uh, we could speculate why it's so important, because we don't have full understanding. This is also very fresh, uh, but we have some ideas. And when we do this procedure, uh, in this case, you have slightly nitrogen-enriched silicon nitride. So it's not stoichiometric anymore. Nitrogen slightly. Uh, has slightly higher proportion. Uh, we actually obtained really bright single photon sources to our surprise. So with purity, again, it's room temperature uh, below 0.2 in uh, most of the cases. In many cases, they're going below 0.1. So if all the peaks for telomescence peak are tend to be grouped around the same uh, spectral range, indicating that this is one particular defect uh, or patterns or whatever, which uh, we still don't know yet, which is responsible for this emission. And of course, this is uh, access to scalable approach where all the industry already exists. You could make really millions of 
structures on the chip, and that uh, makes it exceptionally attractive. So here are some results. Like in this particular case, we studied 130 meters, and this G2, which is uh, outer correlation function, typically used to show us uh, how these photons are really uh, single. So in the smaller G2, the better. And you could see the uh, histogram, so you could see that for most of them, G2 way below 0.2. And that is without any background correction or speak of field free. But in this case, it goes to, uh, down to 0.12. So as I already mentioned, they all picked around the same uh, spectral range, or you could, you could actually say there might be four peaks overlapping peaks, but when you move from one point to another, uh, it still looks very similar. It's stable, meaning this time you don't see like quenching or whatever, it's stable. So the number of counts approaching one million counts per second, routinely it's always hundreds, thousands of counts per second, in many cases approaching uh, 1 million pounds per second. And they have linear polarization as expected for uh, single photon sources. So we realize that it's indeed important and it could have a significant impact. So I, the first thing to do, you need to couple them to waveguide because uh, I, in the end of the day, this uh, photonics-based quantum computing is a bunch of these magnetic interferometers where you control the phase and play this game. So it's very important to couple the single photon sources to wave guy. And we just uh, successfully do it so. Uh, the paper just was accepted actually. So here you could see this silicon nitride wave guy, single photon sources, which you could excite uh, optically. And then it coupled to this mode of this uh, wave guide and out coupled by this gradient and we detect and uh, measure G2 and prove that it's indeed a single photon source. This uh, slide is uh, actually very important and gives us the biggest hope. Um, let me explain why. So what we did, because in the end of the day, you don't want to have them randomly positioned. You want to prepare them in a deterministic fashion. So what we did, we made this array of pillars, silicon nitride pillars, which are sitting on a silica, silicon dioxide substrate. And it turns out that to obtain single photon sources, it depends on the size of this pillar. And the optimal one turns out to be around 100 nanometers or so. And when you do so, what happens, we just absolutely arbitrarily choose uh, 55 pillar emitters in a row. And all of them actually show anti-bunching, meaning the correlation functions below one. And 67% uh, have G2 below 0.5, indicating that they are single photon sources. Why it's important that this number 67? Because normally people prepare single photon sources statistically by using annealing, by using ion bombarding. And in that case, it's controlled naturally by Poissonian process, which gives you 35% to obtain a single photon source. Others would be either no photons or more than one photon. Here, right away, we got 67, which clearly shows it's not random, it's not statistical. So it is probably deterministic, and which indicates that if, if we would be able to optimize the process, then we could approach this number 200%, hopefully, and then you would be able to have an array of these, as many as you wish, uh, single photon sources, and if you would succeed to make them indistinguishable, which is in the key, uh, key part of these uh, applications, then you could seriously talk about uh, Quantum photonic circuit. Yeah, do you know what is the source for this one Right, so what is the source? We do not know, but we have uh, good speculation that they are strain uh, related. Why we believe so? Remember, I mentioned this thermal rapid thermal annealing. So, what we believe happens is uh, the following when you do this rapid annealing, uh, thermal expansion for silicon nitride and silica coefficients of thermal expansions are different you create stress, strain, at the interface between silicon nitride and silica. And if the, rise, the size of your uh, pillar uh, is right, so that when you do this uh, rapid thermal annealing, you create strain, and as a result of this strain, you create a defect. And then what happens, uh, as my colleague Evgeny Norimanov called uh, strain blockade. As soon as you create it, once defect, strain is released and the second one does not appear, which is a great news for us. I think that the mechanism itself would create only single photon source, only one source, not two. 
And uh, if it's all true, then it would be great. Besides, we could control strain electrically. There are many different approaches. But that is as much as we know by now. Strain related, what exactly uh, to be discovered? So it's, as I said, it's very fresh results. So let's, uh, let's move to plasmonics. As I pointed out, it's important to have sources, but silicon nitride and nearly all of them, actually. Typical time of spontaneous time of relaxation is nanosecond. Typical killer uh, decoherence time is 0.1 picosecond. So you need to speed it up so that photon would be emitted before any uh, external decoherence happens. And then you could have this photon seem distinguishable, which is very important to create this cluster states and make all this uh, quantum computation eventually. And uh, it turns out that plasmonics, plasmonics might be the solution for this approach. So let me remind you what is plasmonics about. If you have a small particle, metallic particle, like this one, silver or whatever, typically silver, gold, and if electrons somehow are displaced from the equilibrium, clearly there is a restoring force which would uh, make electrons bounce up and down, which the frequency which depends on the shape of this particle. It's one of the size too, but not as much as on the shape. <laughs> And the energy in this case, the frequency is optical, but the energy is con the, uh, confined to the size of this particle, which could be 10, 20 nanometers. If you would like to have even stronger confinement, you use so-called gap plasmons. Gap plasmons are excited in the electric gap between two metallic particles. Like in this case, uh, epitaxial silver of the highest quality, which actually provided by our Russian collaborators from uh, Bauman University, in, I should say that I worked with silver for all my life. I never saw anything remotely good as what they produce. So in silver, uh, single crystal nanocubes. So and in between, you have this gap. And this, in principle, this gap could be as small as five nanometers. So you could have really dramatic confinement. So but before I proceed further with plasmonics, I just uh, should say a few words about history of plasmonics. It's kind of interesting that Plasmonics as uh, the field of science, which is very important because you bring optics down to nanoscale, was uh, first developed actually for quite complex systems, not simple cubes, antennas, or whatever, but rather random composites. And these random composites quite often have non trivial geometry, such as fractal geometry. So fractal means scale invariant, and it reproduces the structure of the whole on a progressively smaller scale, Either deterministically, like in the case of this forum, we have the same structure on this scale, then on this scale, then on this scale, or statistically, on average, like in the case of this uh, aggregate of colloidal particles. And this is shown in our early work, largely done with uh, Mark Stockman, who uh, passed away not that long ago, and one of pioneers in the field of uh, plasmonics. Fractal morphology promotes localization of collective excitation. So if you excite this plasma uh, excitation in every single particle since they close to each other, you of course form collective excitations. But it turns out, not surprise for us, the uh, structure of this collective most depends on the morphology. And fractal morphology promote this localization. So as a result, you have concentrated energy in very small areas, which we refer to as hotspots. And the local field in these hotspots could exceed the field in the incident light by orders of magnitude, uh, resulting in dramatically enhanced nonlinear processes. But importantly, uh, properties of these structures are defined by structure and geometry rather than uh, material properties, let's say silver, or gold, whatever. So, and in that regard, they're very similar to metamaterials that were developed later. So metamaterial, the whole idea is that by controlling shape and geometry structure, you actually uh, control the optical properties. And that was studied first uh, for the case of uh, random com uh, composites, so you could argue that they served as a precursor for the field of metamaterials, which by now actually uh, has a truly spectacular demonstration, particularly when it uh, comes down to two-dimensional version of metamaterials, or metasurfaces. And there are a number of people who contributed to this uh, field. Uh, historically, probably one of the first was uh, Philippe Lalanne, uh, Eric Sussman, 
but in terms of impact, I should uh, put that Federica capacity truly spectacular work in that regard. So uh, many things have been demonstrated. So in this case, you control phase with this plasmonic or dielectric antennas, and they could be much smaller than the wavelength structure. So you could create basically flat objects and make uh, such basic devices as a lens, hologram, and many others. If you do, if you use so-called active metasources, you could do also very important things like non-reciprocal propagation, uh, which is like holy grail for nanophotonics. So there are now already companies, successful companies, which make devices. So it's clearly in this field uh, is uh, booming, which means it's time to grow. Uh, and that's why I tried to do quantum. Uh, so speaking of plasmonics, this uh, early work we did with uh, York Leuthold from ETH, Zurich, and it's demonstrate the key thing which we are after in the case of plasmonic speed. So what we use here, it's gold ring resonator, and this ring is actually filled uh, with uh, uh, organic uh, optoelectronic material, which changes its refractive index when you apply voltage. So then if you send a signal from this silicon waveguide, if uh, the frequency of this node doesn't pay, uh, match the frequency of this plasmonic resonator, then uh, signal goes through without any loss, any coupling. So if, however, you apply voltage, change the refractive index, and now the uh, frequency of this ring resonator mode, which is the frequency of this waveguide, there is strong coupling and light doesn't go through. So it clearly it works as a modulator, and the key thing about this, it operates at terahertz rates. Terahertz means picosecond. So it means that we really could be close to this decoherence rate. So plasmonics can make processes much faster. So you combine the two biggest things, speed, that's what all optical communication about, and uh, uh, nanometer scale localization with plasmonics. So, but uh, the key ideas I already mentioned in all this, is for cell enhancement. And there are two different approaches to realize for cell enhancement. One which is pursued by 99% uh, of all groups. Uh, it's basically to use so-called electric cavities. The idea is very trivial, actually. Uh, normally, coupling of light to matter to qubit is very small, simply because the size of the wavelengths is much larger than the size of atom. So the huge mismatch, and therefore, coupling is naturally small. But that's also why uh, photons are robust. They don't couple it to each other, they don't have charges, they don't couple much to matter. But you would like actually to, when it's needed, to couple them strongly. If you would like to generate photons to control them, so you would like to have a strong coupling on demand. How to increase this coupling? You just make your photons bounce many times between two mirrors so that effectively it couples stronger, because it just goes through this happen many times. And then that one goes as the ratio, uh, which is quite intuitive, of the quality factor of your cavity and inversely proportional to the volume where your electromagnetic mode is confined. And of course, with cavities such as a uh, defect in a photonic crystal, for example, quality factor could be uh, gigantic, like 100 million. Volume limited by the diffraction limit, by the wavelengths. Uh, the point here, that if your Q is large, yes, you do have this strong light matter coupling, but you sacrifice the speed. And moreover, as you all know, the higher the quality factor, the slower the response. So is there any other way uh, to increase light matter coupling without sacrificing the speed? And that's where plasmonics comes into the game. In plasmonics, Q is modest, just 100. But that's actually good news. It means that the quality factor would be like 100, meaning that the bandwidth would be terahertz, like 10 terahertz. But that's indicate the speed. That's what we're after. Whereas volume to compensate for small Q could be really small. Five, five nanometers, as I mentioned. Five nanometers is 100 times smaller than the wavelengths. You raise it to the power of three, because it's volume here. It gives you million. Only because of confinement, light matter coupling could increase by huge factor. And in this case, you don't sacrifice the speed. Your system is fast and potentially could outpace uh, the rate of decoherence. That's the simple idea which we are after. 
to restrict it further, uh, I'm showing this traditional approach where you basically to deal with the coherence, you simply increase the coherence time, quite natural thing to do. You go to very low temperatures, uh, uh, low pressures, you trap atoms, you trap ions, so you bring in as much control as possible. Of course, it's a very valuable approach, but also, what if we go the other way, or maybe just benefit this approach by simply speeding up the process? For example, one of the key processes uh, when it comes down to quantum photonic circuitry is emission of single photons, as I pointed out. What if my photon emitted before decoherence happened? Then it becomes a to decoherence. It simply just outpaces the decoherence. That's, that's the straightforward idea. So let me give you some uh, examples and some preliminary results. I should say right away, you're not there yet. But what I will show clearly indicates that we should eventually be there, and hopefully sooner rather than later. So uh, we use so-called nanopage antenna. Yeah, that's actually very important. You cannot use a simple uh, plasmonic particle. If you use small plasmonic particle, uh, yes, you have very strong confinement, but the emission of phonons is proportional to the volume. If your particle is, let's say, 10 nanometer in size, it doesn't emit much. You basically confine energy within this particle, and eventually it doesn't have any other way but to go to only closer. So it's not good. Uh, but nanopage antennas is very different in that regard. All the energy is confined in the gap, and gap could be very small, as I pointed out, but the antenna itself uh, could and should be relatively large, like 50 or 60 nanometers, as our uh, calculations show. Then it outcouples photons very efficiently with the rate that could beat not only the coherence rate, but potentially also the rate with uh, which plasmons decay. Because everybody say plasmonics is lossy, but if you outcouple photons before our plasmons decay, it will become a loss-free system. And that could be accomplished, as our calculations show, uh, with these non attachment terms. So this is some first attempts we did. Uh, first was very simple-minded. We took this miracle silver from our uh, collaborators in Palmer, and uh, we randomly distributed nanodiamonds, uh, which were in such, which had such a size that at least some of them had only one single nitrogen vacancy. Typically, let's say 15 and 25 nanometers, 30 nanometers. And then we randomly also distributed these silver cubes on top. And just by chance, in some cases, a cube would end up sitting on the nanodiamond in between silver film and silver cube, so that this, this nanopage antenna uh, falls. So what we obtain that uh, the rate with which uh, emission of single photon occurs in this by factor of 100, which is respectable. And actually, the rate with which uh, uh, yeah, photons were emitted was approaching, uh, if you take into account all transmission uh, losses, and, uh, Collection losses is actually approaches half a billion single photons per second. The room temperature is actually record high. So, and, and also intensity increased by the same factor of 100, which means all this speed up goes to radiation channel. Because it could also go to non radiative channel, but in this case, at least, it does go to radiative channel as we need it. But we need to do it more intelligent way. And our uh, exceptionally talented postdoc. Aksana Makarova, who now works with Michelin in Harvard uh, in graduate school, she actually developed this uh, methodology by basically placing first these nano diamonds on glass, characterizing them, finding really good emitters, then picking it up with uh, a tip, AFM tip, bringing it to a uh, silver film, then with the same tip, she would push these cubes so that it climbs the top of this nano diamond and forms this nano page antenna. Importantly, in this case, it sits exactly at the edge of the cube where the Purcell enhancement is the largest, as our uh, simulation show. In this case, we obtain actually a record short time, uh, lifetime, which was only 23 picosecond and 3,500 times speed up uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, lifetime shortening. Uh, importantly, and that calculation is still done by Jacob Cordino, our collaborator, what he showed that if you optimize your system, and it, in this case it looks like that the size of the cavity should be like 3 nanometer, 
and the size of the cube like 60 nanometers, then the rate with which that system would emit photons would reach 300 terahertz. 300 terahertz would be practically any decoherence rate, even at room temperature, which is particularly attractive. And the efficiency, not surprisingly, is very high. Photons just outcoupled before anything that potentially happen. I should say right away, in this case, we don't reach the limit when you beat the decoherence rate. The reason that the nitrogen frequency decoherence is crazy because of strong electron phonon coupling is actually 0 0.001 picosecond, hard to beat. But there are other emitters with uh, much longer coherence time, such as germanium silicon frequencies or 2D materials, and that's exactly what we're now uh, working with and trying to find out the emitter which would have a relatively long coherence time, so that the plasmonic speed up you need to apply wouldn't be that gigantic. So since I mentioned 2D materials, let me show this uh, uh, recent results, we just submitted it. That's done with HBM, uh, one of the uh, very popular 2D materials. And then this particular one, which has boron vacancy, uh, really good because this uh, spin degree, which uh, related to the ground state, we split in 3.5 gigahertz, which means that you have a spin where you could record the information, it could be your qubit, and it's optically addressable because of uh, different radiation rate for different spin state. Uh, it turns out that photoluminescence for a system with spin one and uh, zero is somewhat different. It's called spin contrast. And it could be detected with optically detected magnetic resonance, or DMR. So that's very important that you could optically create qubit and control it for many quantum applications. And besides, of course, in this case, you have 2D sensor, which you could bring to very close proximity uh, of the material which you would like to probe, if you, for example, want to detect the magnetic field. So that's a, that's a, that's a great sensor for uh, many applications. But the efficiency of optical emission is low. But could we speed it up by using our non batch antennas? So first we did this console simulation, uh, which helped us to answer the question, what is the optimal thickness of HBO? Is it too thin? Maybe there is quenching, not that obvious. And for given thickness, where exactly the uh, defect should be located. And as calculations show, the optimal condition is uh, thickness of HBN flake. It's not a single layer, it's a flake around three uh, sorry, six nanometers, and the depth of defect, not surprisingly, is somewhere in the middle. So in what we are doing, when we place uh, this flake on a silver waveguide, we need waveguide because we need to, to, uh, to induce this spin degree of freedom, this microwave. And the waveguide just enable this efficient excitation of spin degree. But it's made of silver, and if you just scatter silver cube on top, so you have here flake sitting on a silver waveguide, and you spread the silver cube. So in some cases, cube sits right uh, on top of flake, and underneath you have the silver waveguide. You could see that indeed photoluminescence is dramatically increased. You know, this is actually at much, much lower pump than in the case when uh, your uh, uh, flake sitting on silicon. So we have increased uh, slightly as 250, but if you take into account that actually the size of the cube is so much smaller than the size of a laser beam, the enhancement provided by the cube itself, it's way over 1,000. And for 2D materials, it's actually uh, quite spectacularly high uh, enhancement. And we do obtain indeed this uh, uh, spin contrast, which is uh, needed for many sense applications. Uh, let me also very briefly mention yet another activity which we conduct within the Quantum Science Center. It's a big effort, $150 million uh, center supported by DOE. Effort is led by Oak Ridge National Lab and Purdue is in, in academic institution. So uh, but the idea is that even though I said that photonics could enable spectacular application just by itself, but many, many important applications still would benefit for having a quantum system, hybrid quantum system, which involves different degrees of freedom. Steam, magnets, polaritons. <laughs> we actually, I don't touch the polaritons, but polaritons are spectacularly important. I, I see lots of applications for polaritons, but that's another story. Uh, 
I mentioned them on my the context of magnets. So the hybrid quantum platform, which we are working now uh, with, is uh, based on the following idea. So you have this uh, film, and then we're going to work with topological quantum materials, uh, such as uh, quantum spin liquid, uh, like ruthenium chloride. But uh, as a test, we first uh, worked with conventional magnetic field, such as uh, coffee, and it supports magnets. Magnets is just collective excitation of spins. So what you, if you, on top of this, place these uh, nanodiamonds, for example, with nitrogen vacancy, they have also this local spin. So you could uh, induce your spin with microwave photons. In this case, you could control it. And these qubits would couple with each other via magnets. Because it's very important to couple, to entangle them, to take advantage of this broad information space, you need to create this entangled uh, spooky state. So uh, for that, magnets could be actually a very important way. And moreover, you read this uh, spin qubits optically as a project out through this uh, optically detected magnetic resonance. And you could also speed it up, this uh, reading, by using plasmonics. And, uh, Remarkably, you actually could control the coupling, magnet coupling, through ferroelectric effect. If you place it on ferroelectric substrate, when you apply voltage, you actually uh, change the magnet band, and therefore you change the coupling in qubits, as illustrated here. So you have this ferroelectric substrate, you have coffee film, and you have this, uh, nitrogen, uh, this nanodiamond with nitrogen vacancy. So what happens when I apply voltage, it creates stress. Stress changes the magnetization of this field. And as a result, the whole magnet band moves. So let's say without voltage, it doesn't overlap with uh, frequency of this field, which is three gigahertz. But when you apply voltage, it does overlap with frequency of this field, and you have some coupling. So by simply applying voltage, you switch on and off uh, magnetic coupling between speeds, which is very effective. And you can make actually a sensor based on this with record high sensitivity of uh, uh, electrical field, because in that case, you apply to electrical field and change the speed relaxation, which we measure optically. But I could reverse the problem and say, uh, what electrical field caused that particular change in the relaxation rate and uh, use it as a sensor. It turns out that this type of sensor, by totals of magnitude, would be the best sensors existing, something which we hope to demonstrate soon. Uh, well, this is about machine learning. Let me say a few words about machine learning. As I advertise, Sasha will be talking much more about this because she actually needs this effort. But at least a couple of ideas how it really makes a difference. For example, I mentioned this photonic quantum computers would require like a million of sources. But to detect, to find good sources of single photons, you need to do this purity test, this autocorrelation measurements. And let's say if you use small nanodiamonds, diamonds, you would like to have them small so that the gap would be small. Only one of thousand actually has the nitrogen vectors, uh, which results in this single photon emission. So and it, it, it would take forever to characterize it. The question is, could machine learning help to do it much faster if you would like to do this quantum photonic circuitry? This uh, slide illustrates what we normally do. To measure this uh, autocorrelation function, you have this correlation card with two arms, and you measure this uh, signal for the coincidence uh, uh, event as a function of delay. So after several minutes, you have a spectrum like this, then you use this levenberg marquardt fitting, take it, the delay equals zero between two pulses, and if it's below 0.5, we say this is a single photon source. But it takes several minutes for one single photon source, and if you work with millions, it's not a, a scalable approach. So if I do only one second, that the way the spectrum looks like, there is no way to fit it with this function. It looks like it's in, it in principle impossible to say. However, that's what machine learning comes into game. You do this conventional neural uh, network training. So you first classify your data, so you know which one is actually pseudo and which is not, by doing standard approach. But and then you would train your neural network this is a typical classification problem. And after you train it, with very high fidelity or accuracy, the system would say whether it's a single photon source or not, even for this extremely sparse spectrum. And actually, it works truly remarkably well. So these uh, histograms shows that 
without a neural network training, the accuracy with which you predict G2 around 50%, which means actually a random guess, because it's very simple, not simple, just flipping a coin. But after training, you uh, go way be, uh, above 90%. So it works remarkably well. And uh, in then I mentioned yet another thing related to uh, quantum spiral resolution. So you know that super resolution is a big thing, actually. And but it's based the whole notion of this super resolution. It's based actually on four important assumptions that we use linear optic, a stationary sample, homogeneous formation, and classical fields. And breaking either of these results in demonstrated super resolution. For example, if you use nonlinear optics, so called stimulated emission depletion, then uh, actually you beat the resolution limit. If you use non stationary, that resulted in stochastic optical uh, reconstruction microscopy. Uh, by using this inhomogeneous source, you have this structural elimination microscopy. What if you move to quantum imaging techniques? So you get some advantage here. And the idea is actually was <laughs> suggested by this Gedanken experiment, uh, suggested by Stefan Hall, the guy actually who got the Nobel Prize for the super resolution, but not for a different idea for this step microscopy. So he said, well, imagine that we have quantum emitter, which always emits by pairs. Every time it emits, it emits two photons. So then I have, if I have this 50-50 splitter and two cameras, simple multiplication of point spread function would give you the square root of two gain. Because you just have more information if you just process it. So uh, of course, in the case of quantum measurements, when we measure out relation function, we rather uh, uh, do this anti bunching which measure the absence of two photons. It's single photon coincidence measure. But we are dealing with the same statistics, so it, uh, it means that we still should get this big. And that's uh, indeed what can be done and demonstrated, actually. So if you relate the photoluminescence map, which of course is diffraction limited, to G2 map at zero decay. So in every single special point, you take G2 correlation function, zero delay, and delay the two. Then your resolution increases by square root of two. If you take higher correlation function, higher order correlation function, it will be square root of three, four, and so on. But this is a very time consuming measurement to create this G2 map. And this again, where machine learning comes into the game, you just speed it up, and that's what we obtain. This is photoluminescence map, this is G2 map, you correlate the two, you have this square root of PDF. So this is the original uh, sport, and that's what you obtain after doing this correlation measurements, and you have this square root to increase in the resolution. So to sum up these two uh, particular machine learning applications, so with single photon characterization, uh, you actually have need two orders of magnitude speed up, and you're able to say whether it's single or not single photon source within one second, which is in principle impossible with conventional methods. And with this rapid super resolution imaging, you could actually do like 12 times faster the uh, creation of this uh, G2 map. And finally, that's actually what Sasha will be talking largely about tomorrow. Of course, we want to take this idea of machine learning to create in this quantum photonic circuit with many elements which would involve cavity couplers, guiding system, frequency converters. And uh, I mentioned just one thing, Sasha will be talking about many, many others. Uh, that uh, it turns out that this vari variational autoencoder gives a big advantage. So this actually consists of uh, uh, two neural networks. One is actually called encoder, another is decoder. And the important thing, it has this uh, latent space, compact latent space, so that encoder actually compresses training set to this latent space. What we uh, learned with this approach and again, that will be discussed tomorrow in quite far more details, that to, to, to find rather than local maximum, if you randomly choose and start training your system, you almost always end up with local, local maximum. So, but what we did, we used topology optimization, which is time consuming, and we found many local uh, maxima, and then use it as a training set. And then put it into this uh, variational frame encoder, that actually helps to find a uh, global maximum. And again, that will be the subject of tomorrow's lecture, but that just shows that indeed, when it comes down to quantum photonic circuitry, machine learning makes a huge difference. So let me just sum up. So the vision we have 
uh, that one could really uh, build quantum photonic circuitry. And at the heart of this are serial photon sources. And uh, the fact that we obtain them in silicon nitride gives us a big hope. Now, of course, we do many more measurements, low temperature. And uh, in the end, we hope to be able to create deterministic sources of single photons, like millions of them put on the chip, and use this cosmonic speed up, so to ensure that they are indistinguishable, they emit it with rate higher than coherence rate. The idea of this cosmonic speed up uh, could be applied not only for single photon sources, but also for detection, for conversion, and for gates if you go that way. Because it's quite universal. You can find electromagnetic mode, and because of the Purcell enhancement, your system operates faster. And since uh, in circuitry you have to have scalable system, it's very important to have this efficient way to deal with very small signals, which are in the heart of any quantum photonic. Single photons, a couple of entangled photons, they're also small. And uh, machine learning here could make a difference. So we actually did quite a number of recently uh, work in this direction when we showed that this machine learning could be applied for metrology, device optimization, uh, even for the super resolution as I mentioned. So let me end up with this slide, which just would remind what we discussed today. And at this stage, I would be happy to answer your questions. So I have one question. So you, you talked a lot about how you consider species and see the life cycle of one of your things you can get one of your own. I would like to ask what's your opinion about so if one computer has that I don't know. But what about if you compare one computer to then not being never more from just not the people that also have stuff that would be the advantage of being one computer compared to other one. Right. First of all, it's a. I'm not the one who knows all the answers, and I remember calling to David Miller in Stanford uh, after he talked about all this. Some talking about the teacher said, "David, I really don't understand." He said, "Well, anyone who would say in quantum that he or she understands don't believe that." So uh, it's it's complicated. But what you uh, you made a very valuable point. I think it should be inclusive. Uh, indeed, neuromorphic based uh, computation is a very powerful technique. Uh, it doesn't require quantum, it's classical. And uh, like my colleague actually leads this effort in the US and the, the neuromorphic computing based on electronics. I know that in Europe there is a big effort doing neuro neuromorphic computing by employing cosmonics at this one and even scale uh, uh, confinement. You could take advantage of this. It doesn't require anything quantum, and my answer is it, indeed very helpful. But quantum is still unique. I mean, the fact that you use this quantum superposition, it's unique and unparalleled, uh, and brings unique opportunities. And so far, it remains to be seen how far you could take this idea. Quantum simulators, no question about. Sasha, you will talk tomorrow. It's actually truly amazing when we run this machine learning algorithm on quantum machine, like D wave or we still are, we really get remarkable results. So quantum simulators, I no doubt. That's basically you mimic some physics problem in, uh, let's say, reader caverns or whatever you run it, you find the, let's say, the ground state and you get the answer. Uh, no question about it. For a universal quantum computing, it's still a big challenge, and I don't want to sound over-optimistic. Neuromorphic computing is a complementary effort which I fully support. And I think it has great chance to be successful. Basically, it is great. But let me just put this uh, speculative uh, thing. Some people believe our brain actually got quantum. Because, again, uh, just think like how often you would, in parallel, could process very different things. You could say, hey, maybe it is kind of a temporal state with microscopic uh, scale in your brain. So, uh, by saying this, I imply there might be some intrinsic connection between neuromorphic computation and quantum remains to be seen. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, yeah, maybe follow up questions. Um, so, quantum computing is great if you want to harness the performance of the uh, application. 
and infomorphics. Maybe a lot of you can repeat questions. Yeah, if you just have a label to THOS, yeah, L5 to the theory. And in neuromorphics, the matter of the thing is the case of sense, so I guess that it's possible. Yeah, in the coding, the data sets in the well, uh, so the question was, uh, as far as I understood it very vaguely, that there are some gaps in the neuromorphic computer deployed to itself. I, 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 don't, I don't want to pretend that I'm an expert in neuromorphic computer. Uh, you're probably right, but uh, I mean, if you ask me, based on what I know about neuromorphic computers, and as I said, my like uh, uh, Troy actually uh, leads this set of new LC, he's a director of big set. I would say the neuromorphic computers should go. I mean, that's, it's, let's say it's, it's more near to uh, things to happen, in my humble opinion. Quantum simulators would beat anything, but they are not universal computers. That's where universal quantum computer still remains to be uh, long to matter. But as I said, uh, with photonic approach, I think we have a bigger chance to succeed even in relatively near future. Just because of much smaller error rate. Because of the fact that photons are so robust, fast and robust. And the only trick is to speed up public to matter when it's needed. That's at least our simple-minded approach. Maybe I should... Yes, please, because I, I have showed the idea. Maybe you can talk to microphone, I don't know if you can... I the question is how, how do you input a big data set into a quantum computer? Mm. How to, yeah. That's actually a very good question. Uh, let me, again, I don't know the slides, but let me discuss this in the Big context. number of single emitters. In the, in the context of uh, machine learning required for photonics. Because uh, many believe in for a good reason. Machine learning uh, has not been used that much for optics. And that's because the training set is actually not big enough. You really have to have huge, the, the larger the training set, the uh, better your machine learning works, right? And with optics, it's, I mean, you do measurements, but if you really are able to do, let's say, thousand measurements, you normally already accomplish what you want. So it's hard to create large training set. That's what Sasha will be discussing tomorrow, which I think is very a beautiful idea, you could use machine learning itself to grow the training itself, to create a training itself. So that it would be much enough that machine learning always would work efficiently. And that's what we are doing. So yes, it is a problem to have large uh, training set that uh, all success is proportional to it. But it turns out that machine learning could be forced to create and significantly broaden the training set itself. So, but I, uh, I, I leave it for tomorrow's discussion. But it's a very good point. And that's, in my opinion, why it hasn't been used as much as it should be in the so far. Uh, so, uh, I had a question about your two uh, measurements with the band, like one second measurement. So, normally, the, 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 the neural network should pick up some structure or some data that you can see, obviously. So, in, in your case, is, is it just uh, denoising, or do you think there is some underlying uh, structure in the count that's been picked up? Right, so uh, it's, it's basically cheap. from a medical point of view, typical classification problem. Uh, I, what I forgot to say that uh, to make it work, you have to have a specific model. Like in this case, for nitrogen vacancy, it's a three level model, you have to have model. And the machine learning the use, it's limited to a particular type of uh, emitters. But for any class of emitters, as soon as you have model, you could make your machine learning very efficient. So that basically, then you run this classification problem. So by uh, training your machine on this method, it would save you uh, uh, very fast uh, whether, it, whether it's A or B. Uh, the, we tried many different algorithms, machine learning, I don't even remember now which one will be better. But since I started to talk about this, I, I, I'd like to make another comment. I, I'm not sure that it was discussed yet. What we learned from our experience, we started to work on machine learning, which is already like three years. Um, the existing algorithms of machine learning algorithms were developed for problems like speech recognition, image recognition. They're not really suited for our problem. 
When you talk to computer scientists, I hope I don't uh, hurt anybody's feelings here, they're so uninterested in uh, developing new algorithms uh, which would be suitable for physics for some reason. So we decided to better do it ourselves. So what we call physics informed algorithm, which would take into account symmetry uh, of a particular problem, a specific model, and it could be uh, done by far more efficient. So the problem of developing new machine learning algorithm, which would be specifically developed for a particular class of problem, that's now in huge demand rather than using this very standard one. And uh, that's particularly important when you start running them on uh, quantum machines. Question. I mentioned twice a questionable uh, success in quantum simulators. Can you um, can you clarify which uh, practical problem? I, I guess I wasn't like clear. I am very much excited about demonstration of quantum simulators. No question about it. I think it's a spectacular. I, I, when I said question about in terms of uh, making unique, uh, you saw universal no, 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 no. So I, uh, but a particular practical example of uh, practical, what practical application. Why, what, what oh, with boson sampling problem, which I mentioned. Of course, you could say, uh, why do we need this? Uh, I should say that at this stage, we don't have example, at least I don't know example, which would, uh, uh, which would, uh, would be in a position to play practical applications. But I, we work now very closely with Michel O'Kin's PR company. Uh, they very serious trying to apply to finances. Because I mean, the problems mathematically could be mapped from different areas. And then if you run your this rebirth system, let it evolve into the ground state and measure all the characteristics, eventually you find solutions to your problem, whatever it is. Like what Sasha will be talking about, like Cuba problem is, uh, uh, which is described so many problems like this. Uh, travel, travel uh, salesman and Mark Star and so on. And you can mimic Cuba problem to Isaac Kamiponian problem, which is straightforward, and rather than D wave, that's what you're already doing. And then you could find solution for problem, whatever is described by Cuba. There are quite a number of problems which you could describe by Cuba. But that, and that, that might be the question about neuromotive computing, which does pretty much the same thing, but classically and already shows the success. Whereas the D wave has never demonstrated. I can you please demute yourself or can I do? Okay. As outras coisas que eu fiz estavam ali. Foi tudo para lixo. Aqueles tirinhos. Não, não. Estavam ali dois ou três. Não era nada deles, não era selada, não sei o quê. Eu estava tudo de fogo. O colado. It's good that you're not saying such a lousy lecture. I have four hours. Se calhar também é melhor não ficar cá para o ano. Oh, they must say. Vou ter a tia que se calhar também é melhor não ficar cá para o ano, porque está insertado. Sorry. Yeah. I can mute. I can mute everyone, but then you can mute uh, the speaker. It's okay. It's so far we already have a Clearly, the we just type with the dynamics, so it's uh, it's not just let's say steady time solution. It's actually you just type all the dynamics. I'm not that familiar with neuromorphic. I know it's not actually that fast. I'm not sure it would be able to provide that complete solution for uh, a problem. But also, like for example, this boson sampling, uh, I don't think they are there to do something. Similar with neuromorphic computers, like my girl. 
remains to be seen. It's exciting. Oh, yes, please. You mentioned something in your talk about machine learning and optics, and you said one issue is that you just don't have enough data. But I would think of optics would be the place where you can just generate data. So what kind of data we're talking about that you don't have enough data? Because you know, making optical measurements is not so hard. Some measurements are hard because if you need to that's so once you set up, what I want to say is that once you have a setup and you're like, don't touch it. But that's exactly why uh I mean, it's really, we don't have usually enough training set because in the optical measurements, it's hard. I mean, if you're really able to do, let's say, 50 times measurement, you already learn a lot. If to create just training set, it's, it's kind of not what we do. I don't know anyone actually doing this. Uh, it is hard, but as I pointed out, uh, for optics, uh, the approach at least which we showed has advantages actually to uh, to create training set with machine learning itself. What kind of problems? Many of them, like for example, that's the recognition of uh, uh, characterization of emitters based on a very sparse spectra, or let's say image recognition, optical image recognition. And it's, it's a very complex and important problem. Let's say microscopy, you look at some pictures in, uh, let's say, uh, really like lots of bits of information, like in conventional image. You look on the eyes and you could. It's called, I believe, a special or whatever. You look on the tire, you recognize the person. I mean, doing something similar, let's say, for spectra. Like, for example, one of the biggest problems, microscopy, let's say, uh, pollutants recognition. And you have usually spectra which are extremely rich. And it's so hard to see whether there is some sulfide presence or not. By training, by training machine learning, neural network, you could immediately say, hey, there is that much uh, sulfide in the atmosphere. This is a beautiful, spectacular application. Spectroscopy, like pollutants, for example, or many other applications, I would say, some hazardous materials. So spectra are usually so rich, there are so many things which you need, and to find out what you want, that's a typical problem for a shooter. Can I also mention one point? So you, you, you were talking about deterministic single photonometer, right? It's very interesting. And I think machine, uh, but you also said it is not clear what is the mechanism, what is the model. So machine learning can be actually good in identification of the model. Look, look at sparse identification, you get measurements, you create model, and then you add physics, which you'll explain. This can't model. agree more. Absolutely. Very good comment. And, but to, to get there, we started to work with serious material scientists. I mean, even we do lots of material scientists, but we are not trained as material scientists with the theories from Harvard, actually you really need to like, like strain all this type of thing. It's such a complicated thing. I mean, but that's exactly what we're doing. We're building a model which describes stress and our stress in our strain in our situation. And then we hope but, to, but to measurements can help you to build model. That's my point. I understand. So. But still there should be some basic model to put there. Yeah, yeah, no. Like how to describe can we come it? from both sides. So well, as soon as we will develop a simple model, theoretical model, and then you're absolutely right. Machine learning could put your that's doing measurements, you could actually like as a function of size, this big height of this cylinders, you do all these measurements, and then by the way, I forgot to say another beauty is we did measure it as a function of uh, height of cylinders, nothing changes. So these two D meters, they actually two D, they sit in one and say Z, Z position. They are the interface of silica and silica micro, which is very important quantum system by itself. So it's because it's all an interface, it's to this system. But you're absolutely right. Machine learning could help to understand the physical nature of these meters. That's, that's the way much to apply machine learning. It's a good point to finish. So let's thank uh, one again. Excuse me, I have a question. I have a question. Announcement. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Uh, so yeah, I, I have a question about. So, I don't know if you said so, Ryan, but you, you will have to use it, or this is what it's here. But otherwise, you have the stick as well? I, mean, I have a sticker for this one, but you could use it, please, if you want to. This one belongs to this one? No, no, to this one. Okay. But use, use mine, it's mine. Remember to take it back. Bye.
Okay, we move to the second talk, which will be given by Neil Davidson from Lifestyle Institute. Uh, I know the discussions are important, but how do you Okay, Okay, I'll move Maybe for, for this you can use this because it I works, tried, it works so large. Both. For some reason, none of them did work for me. This one was working for a lot. I don't think this was really working now. How about light? Does it need light? Never mind. But can you switch? I tried. I tried both. Okay. Okay, we'll do it the low tech way. Yeah, just relax. <laughs> hey, here there is. Okay, sorry for the failure of uh, electronics. <laughs> um, so I start by thanking all the organizers, not just some of them, for inviting me here. Um, and uh, I want to apologize for the other speakers here. I took seriously the fact that it's a school, so I will try to be rather basic. So I hope this will help the students to get like the basic ideas, but this will also result of the other speakers hearing again things they already heard. <laughs> right. How would that point? Okay. So the title of my talk is uh, how to simulate spins, XY spins, classical XY spins, uh, and use that to solve computational problem with coupled lasers. I want to tell you what are coupled lasers, in case you don't know. So you see in this picture uh, many, many spots. Each one of them is a laser coming in front of you. That's about a centimeter. Uh, there are 1,500 lasers here. And uh, what, you, uh, what you have to ask yourself is what is the phase? Each, one, each laser is a Gaussian single mode and has a certain phase. It's a number between 0 and 2 pi. And the question is, is there a relation between the phase of the different lasers? If the lasers are not coupled, then the relative phase between them is random. And in that case, when you interfere their fields, you have to sum up the intensities. And the result is, when you go far away, it's called the diffraction pattern, or not what it's called far field, what you get is the sum of the intensities of each diffraction pattern. And in optics, you know something that is small, diffracts to a large spot. So what you see here, is either the spot, diffraction spot from each laser, multiplied by 1,500, just some of the intensities. So this picture shows you a large spot and tells you there's no phase relation between the beams. If somehow, by coupling the lasers, as I will show you in this talk, you get all of them to have exactly the same optical phase. Let's call it zero. So I have zero, zero, zero. And now you ask what is the diffraction pattern. You have to take all these fields and interfere them and you get this diffraction pattern, which is strikingly different. In particular, you see that the diffraction spot at the far field is much smaller than the spot here, which indicates that there's a lot more concentrated energy. Quantitatively, the size of this diffraction pot is actually the Fourier transform of the coherence width of the laser. Okay? And this is sometimes called Bragg peak. Okay? So you can actually, if you measure, you can see that this area is smaller than this area by 1,500, which is the number of phase log claim, because when you add fields, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, and then take the square, you get a much larger answer than when you take 1 square plus 1 square plus 1 square. And clearly, and this is called phase locking between the laser, or if you want coherent combining of beams, 
And there are many applications for that. I chose some of them, where you don't want just a lot of power, but you want to consolidate the power to a small spot. And let me show you my favorite. <laughs> you think you want to cut your pizza? <laughs> And this is a well-known effect. Actually, I think the fact that oscillators that are coupled tend to phase up was first observed by Huygens when he was seeing these two pendulum walks. <coughs> I couldn't find the documentation. I will show you a newer one. This is from YouTube, from this guy. <coughs> I think originated by Strogatz. Uh, you take these oscillators, they have roughly the same frequency, otherwise it wouldn't work. But you see, they are not synchronized in phase. Now you have to couple them, so they are sitting on this uh, piece of wood. We'll put them on these two pens. Isn't that nice? And this goes forever. So what happens? The coupling between the oscillators is dissipative. Namely, there is loss in the system, and the loss depends on the relative phase between the oscillators. Okay? And oscillators are systems that know how to find the minimal loss of operation. If you ever work with lasers, you know lasers have mode competition. Lasers are ever so clever to find the, lo the mode of minimal loss. Okay? So the engineering here, by using this very clever engineering device, is to ensure that when the phase between the lasers, in this case, is zero, this would create minimal loss, say, friction in this system. And that's all you have to do. The system will dissipate itself into this minimal loss solution. By the way, in terms of what kind of coupling we have here, so you can see that the coupling is mediated by this piece of wood. So this is all to all. You want wind field. And this is another advantage of optics that can do all sorts of coupling. So this is the basic idea. What we do with the lasers is exactly the same will introduce loss into the system. And if you work in, in, in a unitary quantum computers, you say loss is terrible. But if you work with annealers, you know loss is sometimes your friend. But it has to be a clever loss. It has to be a loss that depends on the phase. And you have to engineer the landscape of the loss such that the minimal loss solution is the answer to what you want. This is the idea. And this brings me to the sort of more modern part of why we do these things. And this is the relation between the lasers. I already mentioned that the laser have a phase, a number between 0 and 2 pi, which I can plot as a little error. And what I'm going to show you is that there is actually a strong connection between this minimal loss solution of the lasers and the minimal energy of the XY spin Hamiltonian. So we'll have a spin simulator. OK? And we're not the first to do spin simulators, not even in this room. <laughs> so just to give you like the general idea, this is something called coherent computing. Coherent because the phases uh, are, are the coherent part of the, of the wave function. We need the phases. So you can imagine doing some kind of optimization problem where the vertical uh, axis is not uh, money or uh, energy as usual, but it's loss. Why? Because we are in this minimization of loss. And the horizontal axis, I chose one of the laser phases, but remember, we actually have 1,500 lasers. So I should have plotted for you a 1,500 dimensional Hilbert space, which I don't know how to do. So this is really a complex landscape. And this is a loss landscape. It's not an energy landscape. And what we are looking is to find this global minima. And as you can immediately see, there are many difficulties to do so. For example, there's many, many local minima where the system gets, gets stuck. Actually, it's speculated it for a hard problem, like the traveling agent that you mentioned. There are exponentially many of these local minima. So you have to have all sorts of tricks. And, and, and this is what this community is doing, basically. OK, so this is just to have a picture of what, what, what's going on. One small advantage that we have is that we don't have to cool the system from the outside, like all the atom people have to do. For example, the other system will dissipate itself and find some kind of a minima, either the global minima, and then we're OK, or the local minima, and then we're less happy. But at least to go to the minima is sort of natural dissipative system. So dissipation is not no, that bad. And this is a striking recent publication originating from Yamamoto's pioneering world, but this is now beyond. You know, this is for really 
great engineers, uh, and they, they do uh, Ising uh, machine, because they do OPOs, which have zero and pi. We do XY machines because we have a laser. And they went all this, all this way to get 100,000 spins. This number isn't the only number you should quote, because then you should ask, what is the connectivity, which is not bad here. How is the connectivity done? And, and this, there are a lot of control. This is a young field. Still, there's some controversies. How quantum it is, how the connections are general, etc., uh, etc. Et I, I will not go to any of these uh, controversies. Uh, I will just say this is a young, but still rapidly emerging field. So here's B wave that uh, Vlad mentioned. Uh, here's us with the lasers, uh, OPOs, and all sorts of funny system. Uh, even droplets turned out and calculate, and we heard it from Peter. Um, let me just mention that there's a, a spin-off company that emerged from Weizmann for my group, where students are trying to engineer this well. But this is what you have to do now, so you can compete with other well-engineered systems. And in particular, what they are trying to do is to implement this vector matrix. And I remind you from Peter's lecture, vector matrix just means that you have like this general connectivity that you can program. As Peter mentioned, the ideas are from the 80s to actually implement them is not easy. In particular, where we, are, we want to do all this connectivity inside the laser cavity. We cannot tolerate loss. So many of these ideas are extremely lossy. Typical efficiencies of this vector matrix is 1%. But when you do something 1% efficiency inside the laser cavity, you need a gain which is more than 100 just to lay it. So we cannot afford it. We have to find more efficient and sort of simplified. So this is a lot of work in this company. In this talk, I will tell you not on the general vector matrix ideas, but sort of physically motivated examples. All to all, nearest neighbor, things like that, because that's often what we have in physics. So this is not really a general solver. I'm not going to solve you your uh, investment uh, uh, portfolio, <laughs> which is, I hope, uh, not as simple as my, what I'm doing. OK. So there are actually two parts of the talk, but I'll only give the first one. And the first one has to do with using these individual lasers, where each laser is a relatively simple single frequency Gaussian mode, which we will map to spins. OK? Uh, and we have up to 5,000 of them. Uh, another uh, large body of work that we have uh, is uh, to work with the modes of the laser. The one advantage of working, there are two advantages. One is simpler. We don't have to like generate this individual laser. And the other one, we can do many, many more. So a typical laser that we have is the generate cavity and support about a million modes. So it's a much larger number than only 5,000 lasers. Uh, and the kind of problems that you ask when you have a continuous system with disorder, with localization, are of course different, but that's for the next school. So today, we're only going to talk about this array of lasers. And because it's a school, I want to make sure we are all in the same pace. So I, I want first to define what do I mean when I say phase locking of two lasers. So you probably know that if you take two lasers, you interfere them on the screen, you will not see interference fringes. And the reason, because there are fluctuations between the phase between them. So the phase of each laser actually fluctuates. Even the best laser in the world, which is probably built somewhere in NIST, still fluctuating. OK? So phase blocking doesn't mean that the phase doesn't fluctuate. It means that the two lasers, the phase of the first one and the phase of the second one, they both fluctuate in a correlated way. So the phase different between them is strictly constant, and that means that you will see these interference fringes from the morning to the evening to the next day. This is phase locking. OK? Of course, for very short times, you can take two independent fields and still see some interference between them. I'm talking about the long term. OK. I'll show you maybe three methods of coupling. I told you that the lasers are coupled, but of course, I have to show how. So let me start with the simplest one, probably the one each one of you would guess. Just put them close to each other and let light leak. You know, light leaks. It doesn't stay confined. <laughs> Maybe in plasmonic it does, but usually it leaks. So what we are doing here, we are taking two fields. And as you can see, we are putting them inside the laser cavity. So we have gain. Laser needs gain. We have two mirrors. One of them is a bit transparent, so light goes out. And I'm already showing you that we are using the same mirror for the two lasers. And I'll do the same for the 1500. Why? First to save, only two mirrors, I don't need four. 
And second, because this ensures that the optical distance is quite accurate. Actually, in our experiments, it's on the order of lambda divided by 500, a few nanometers. And as I already showed you with these uh, oscillators, you want to control the relative frequency between the lasers to control this process of phase locking. It's extremely sensitive. Every small deviation in optics in general of a tiny fraction of the wavelengths changes the phase significantly. Okay? So what I'm doing here, you could say, oh, it's just one laser. But it's actually two fields, and these two fields now will go back and forth in the cavity. Here they do. And then they spread a little bit and they overlap. And now because it's a school, there's a quiz <laughs> for you guys. Uh, remember, we want to predict what will be the relative phase between these two fields. And we know the tool. The tool will be, the relative phase will be such that loss is minimal. Okay? So what phase, and you see here there's a piece of metal which blocks the field. And we want this piece of metal, these are holes, this is fine, and this is blocking. So what kind of phase between these two fields would reduce the blockage in between? Zero, five, five. Here, let's do it. Here's that. Sorry. Here's the answer. So with the time phase between them, they disrupted the interface here. This is clearly minimizes the loss, and this is the phase that will be selected by the mode competition. Okay? Think about it like this. It's just, it's a simple system. We can write this by a two by two matrix, the coupling. But remember, the coupling is dissipative, so the eigenvalues will not be real, like in our good old quantum mechanics, but they'll be complex, imaginary. So you start with any solution, let's say in phase and out of phase, zero and pi, some superposition between them. Each one will propagate with time, not as e to the i omega t, but e to the minus lambda t, because the omega is complex. Right? So who will die first? The one with the largest loss. So this is another way to think about the dissipation and why we get this fourth way. And so this dissipative coupling minimizes loss. This is, I'm saying it many times because it's crucial. And in this particular case, uh, the amount of coupling is the overlap between the fields, and because two Gaussians, the overlap between them is sort of a Gaussian, this we call short range. If there was another laser farther away, the coupling to it would drop down faster than exponential. So in this particular case, we can call it nearest neighbor. Okay? And we would see these fringes, and by the position of the fringes, we could make sure that indeed it's high phase and not zero, etc. Of course, we don't want two, we want 1,500. So this is, again, the, the picture. And instead of having two holes in the mask, we have 1,500 or up to 5,000 holes. And in this case, we put the holes in a square lattice. So this is what I showed you in the beginning. There's a little problem here that now, because everything is so small, it diffracts too much. So we cannot even start by having them not coupled as before. So we have to sort of fight the coupling. And there's a trick to do that. I'm sure some of you know that. And you know that. And the trick is to put a telescope inside the cavity. Okay? This is an amazing cavity. It's called the generate cavity. It was invented like all the clever things in lasers in the early 60s. Okay? And there are many ways to say what happens. Let me use two. The first one is now the light coming from each one of these holes, which I call a laser, is imaged by the 4F telescope, inverted and then imaged back by the 4 telescope, imaged in frequency in amplitude and phase. That's what telescopes do. And because it's 4F and another 4F, it's 8F, so it's invert, invert, so it goes back zero. So no coupling if everything is well aligned. Okay? Another way to, to say it is any field distribution which you put here, like many holes, is imaged back upon itself, so the modes of this cavity are all degenerate. And as I said already, there's about a million of them. So we have million degenerate mode. And this is a very good tool to start playing games. This is our resource, so to say. Of course, in the end, we want to break the degeneracy and to break the degeneracy of loss, but this will be due, due to our doing and not due to the system property. OK? So I already showed you that if I do nothing, this is what I get, uncoupled lasers. The, diff the diffraction pattern is the sum of the intensities because there's no phase relation between the lasers. And this is an indication that the student aligned the telescope well. It took some effort. So these are small holes. And now, how do we introduce the coupling? Similarly to what we did before, all we have to do is to move this mirror away just a little bit, let these spots 
overlap. So just now they are overlapping with the nearest neighbor. And remember, when these two overlap, they would want pi phase between them to destructively interfere in the center. And we get this picture. What do you see here? We see sharp diffraction spots. Every time you see sharp diffraction spots, it means that we have a long range order in the phase. Remember this Fourier relation. The fact that we have darkness in the center and the bright peaks are at the, if you want, edges of the brilliant zone, shows us we have zero pi, zero pi, this staggered or anti-ferromagnetic phase. And it turns out that if I move the mirror just a little bit longer, I get what I showed you in the beginning, this in phase. So how can in phase, I told you it's a pi phase. So it's a little bit technical, I, I say for the teachers. Uh, what really matters by the coupling is the optical path. And the optical path between the light the laser returns to itself and the laser sends to the other laser is related to what we know as the Talbot effect. So at different fractions of the Talbot distance, there is a either pi or two pi difference in this distance and two pi is like zero and we get the in phase. What is nice about this technical explanation, forgive me for those that didn't follow, that I can li not limit myself to zero or pi, I can do anything. And I can control the complex coupling. What does it mean that the complex <laughs> coupling? That now I have a dispersive part and dissipative part. And I will come back to that later. Okay? So I can have, if, if I want to build some kind of a spin simulator, you know, real spins are either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, depending on their atomic properties. But I have these virtual spins, they're more clever, and I can make them ferromagnetic, I can make them anti-ferromagnetic, and I can make them, you know, whatever. So it's a richer system. I can also, so, sorry, I, I showed you this and I told you, believe me, this is zero pi, zero pi, long range. I hope you be believe me. Actually, you can do it with sort of phase reconstruction, but suppose you're skeptic. You really want to see the phase of each laser. I, you can do that because optics, that's what optics knows how to do. So what we do is this trick. We take a picture of the lasers. We choose one of them, the one with a little circle. We expand it and we interfere it with all the rest. So one laser is interfering with 1,500 lasers, and you see these many, many little interference fringes are magnified. They tell you what is the relative phase between each laser in the array and the one I chose. Okay? And then you ask MATLAB to do, you know, Fourier, filter, inverse Fourier, and it shows you what is the magnitude of the fringes. This is the coherence function. And what is the value? This is the phase. And this is what we get here. You see this color code, this zero pi, zero pi. It's, uh, it's not the intensity, it's the phase obtained from this picture. So we have a lot of information. So did we do it? Did we build the spin simulator? Is it perfect? Um, yes and no. Let's start with the yes. <laughs> okay. okay, let's start with the yes and then the no will come. So the yes is the following. If I take up a laser and I freeze, you know, laser is complicated. We already heard it in many talks. There's lots of degrees of freedom inside and you know, spectral and polarization. Let's freeze all of them for a while. And all we are left, we even freeze the intensity. Let's assume all the lasers have the same intensity. And, you know, when you write a laser equation, there are three equations for the amplitude, the phase, and the gain. But if the amplitude is constant, the gain is constant. So we are left only with a single equation for the phase of each laser. So for the coupled laser equation, we get this. This is the equation for the phase of each laser as it is coupled to the phase difference with all the other lasers. This is a very famous equation. I'm sure many of you heard about it. It's called Kuramuto. There's some other names. It's very general to describe coupled oscillators, like people clapping their hands sometimes synchronizing, as I hope will happen in the end of this talk, uh, birds singing in the forest, people walking on bridges, also coupled lasers. Remember, to get it, we had to freeze all the degrees of freedom of the laser except the phase. And the phase, because we assume it's classical, no quantum, it's just a classical number between 0 and 2 pi, we plot it as a little arrow, and we call it an XY classical spin. And now I write the, the XY spin Hamiltonian, and now I'm telling you, this is a punchline. The minimal loss solution, this global loss minima that we saw before for the Kuramuto is identical mathematically to the ground state of the XY. So yes, under these assumptions, we have a spin 
stimulator. Okay, if the laser knows how to find a minima loss solution and wasn't stuck in one of these annoying local minima, it actually dissipated itself to the ground state of the XY where we use this one-to-one -one mapping. So this is fantastic. Are these assumptions correct or more, more than that? Are they consistent? And the answer is no. That's the no part. <laughs> so, so here's the story. So this is the yes part. So the yes part, I, I, I hope the laser finds the minimal of state. Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe it gets stuck. If I do that and I use this freezing mapping, I get a Koromoto stable fixed point. OK? And then from here to here, I just told you, this will not change. This is correct. And this little arrow here hints that once you know how to find ground state of spin Hamiltonia, X, Y, I think, you know, there's a whole world that was already done for you. And, and Vlad mentioned it. There's all these mappings that you can use between you and many problems which are mapped to themselves. Of course, there's always this overhead, and sometimes this overhead is quite big, but you know, we are now in there. You know, before I, I forget, I mean, unless you would say it all right away, it would be tremendously important if you could try to make this simple analogy with a frustrated magnetism, like, like quantum spin liquids, which is in the heart of this topological problem. In there will be a relation like you showed. Before. This will come into slides. Okay? Uh, partly, of course. I'm, right. I'm, I'm not going to answer all your dreams, but at least as, as an example, I, I will show that. Uh, so, so here's the problem. The problem is not of assumptions not being always correct, this we know, and sometimes actually it's fun to break them, and we'll do that. The problem with the assumptions are not consistent. And it turns out that this one, of having uniform intensity is actually not consistent. Uh, several people notice it, Natalia noticed it, Yamamoto noticed it, we noticed that uh, there's actually, and, and, and let, let me just illustrate, I, I don't want to go deep into that, I'm running out of time, but just to show you the problem. So here's the problem. This is only five spins, we call it the house, that's why. <laughs> it's a net spin network, which looks like a house, and, and these are the spins connected to nearest neighbor with negative coupling. So what they want to do in life is zero pi, zero pi. Of course, but these guys in the way, if it was only for it was zero pi, zero pi, and this is what they find, okay? And now we ask the lasers to do that. So what would minimize the loss of the laser and no angle? The laser system decides to turn off the top one because it's un inherently unhappy because it gets frustrating signals. And the rest four lasers are now happy and they can do zero pi, which minimizes their loss. You see, it's not identical. And the fact, the fact that this laser shut off is not because we didn't prepare it well, it's not because it's, it's not identical, it's because of the topology of the network. So it's inconsistent. And we studied this actually in quite detail, but let me skip that. Uh, we actually found, in addition to that, that if we force the lasers to have the same intensity, which we could do, because it's a small network, we retrieve the XY solution very accurately. But guess what? How complex would be the procedure to enforce the lasers to have a uniform intensity? It's going to be hard. Let's say and be hard. Okay? So there's like this conservation. Something has to be hard here. Because in, in a sense, the lasers, at least in the linear approximation, they just diagonalize a matrix, and this is not hard. Okay? So you have to, if you really want to understand the system, it's not enough to understand the linear part of the system. You have to think about the nonlinear part of the laser, and this gets rapidly complicated. Okay. So we have one example where our laser solver worked. This was the square lattice with positive and negative, because we know that's the solution for the XY. Let's ask him two more questions. Let's see if he succeeds twice. So the first one is triangular lattice still with nearest neighbor negative coupling. So let me just remind you that if you take triangular lattice and each laser wants to be pi with the other, but they cannot. So what they find is a solution of zero plus 120 minus 120, something like that. Okay, this is in the books. This is X, Y. Uh, and our lasers solve it well. How do I know? I could show you the interference, but I skip. I, I, when I see small points, it means that the laser found a solution. Usually when they find a good solution all around, it's the correct one. Actually, for the experts, there's two degeneracy here. Because on each triangle, I could either do a little vortex or a little anti-vortex. But that's it. So let's say this is zero plus minus, then you have zero and minus, it has to be plus. So I reconstruct only two ground states, two degeneracy. 
okay, so 50% success <laughs> for our, and now we, now we give him another exercise, it's a bit more difficult, it's one of these Kagome lattices which you may have referred. So Kagome is very similar to this triangular lattice, it's a set of triangles, except that they only touch at the corner. You see I removed about a quarter of the lasers. And if we assume only nearest neighbor interaction, this leads to a big difference in the ground state degeneracy. Let me convince you. you. You start with a single triangle, and you know that you have two degenerate solutions for the x, y. The little vortex and the little unknown vortex. And now we go to the second triangle, you have another two degeneracy. So all in all, we have about 500 triangles. The ground state of the XY Hamiltonian on this Kagome lattice, by the way, is motivated by real materials which look sort of similar to that. And indeed, they are, have this really weird physical phenomena, which are called steam liquids, which break the, the, the mean field approximation. So they're extremely interesting. But we don't have any quantum progress here. We just look on the classical manifestation. And guess what? Our laser failed. <laughs> Fortunately, it failed. So it could not find a long, it could not form long range order in the system. Remember, long range order in the system, you have to see something sharp. And instead it got this nice, it's called Star of David. And I have David in my name, so I'm not unhappy. But, <laughs> but uh, and you, you can see, by the way, that there's some amount of order here. This is not like a blob. For example, you see it's dark in the center. This is because locally, we have these little vortices which ensure that you have destructive interference on the local scale. You see these tiny features. Actually, we went into the literature. We had to go all the way to the 1990s. And we find these two famous people, Mosler and Schocker, they are big names in this geometric frustration business. And they calculated, not for coupled lasers, <laughs> but for frustrated magnets, they coupled this uh, structural factor, which you would get if you would be able to build it, nobody can, and to scatter, say, polarized neutrons through it. This is what you should see in the atomic scale. And if you look carefully, this, by the way, this is called bow tie. You see this bow tie? And this reflects some kind of a long range correlation which comes from the need to closed loops. So I cheated a little bit. When I said 2 to the power 500, I have to divide by some polynomial. <laughs> okay? And, and this is manifested. And so even when we fail, we fail in a proper way. <laughs> and, and, uh, and we find something like a superposition. And if you ask me in the end, I will tell you what happens here. Do we jump between solutions? Do they coexist? Do we sample the face phase properly? when we have these many solutions. And I also want just to remind you, this is a very exotic space. For example, if you know the third law of thermodynamic, which tells you that the specific it has to go to zero, as the temperature goes to zero, it breaks. But they still have finite entropy at zero temperature because of this degeneracy. So there's a lot of physics to be done here, and we are quite interesting. It's also highly related to spin glasses, of course, which also have this very complex, and to general soldiers. What is good about our lasers, that are not real spins, they are fictitious spins, and we can cheat. And what we did here, if you remember the mirror, we moved the mirror a little bit more, and we allowed for a very small next nearest neighbor interaction. So now, this laser does interact only with the neighbors, but very slowly also with this guy. And if you look on the picture and count until five, you'll convince yourself this breaks the degeneracy, regardless if it's positive or negative. And indeed, our diffraction pattern has these sharp practice emerging immediately. Okay? Let me jump and show you yet another coupling scheme. And all the coupling scheme I'm showing you, I want to remind you, they are not coming from the vector matrix, they are not you know, arbitrary solvers, they are physically motivated. Okay? So what I want to do now, I want to do long-range coupling. If you want all to all. And this is so easy in optics. And the way I do it is the following. Remember this uh, menace and the lasers and the forest telescope. And here in the Fourier plane of the telescope, I put an aperture and I close it all the way until it's a delta function. In optics, when you say delta function, you mean the diffraction limit of the system. So it's not zero. Okay? Now we, we are experts. We know how to guess phase locking. So what kind of phase distribution here would minimize the loss of the system? Clearly, in phase. Remember, if, if the lasers were all in phase, the diffraction pattern would have this sharp spot in the center that would go through the hole without any losses. Okay? We also know that light coming from any laser that goes through this delta function is well defined in position space, so it's completely undefined in momentum space, so it sort of forgot where it came from. 
So when it goes back to the laser, it will distribute itself among all the other lasers. So we have mean field. More quantitatively, if you remember the convolution theorem, then what we are doing here, we are multiplying the Fourier of this field by a mass. And when you multiply the Fourier, you convolve this field with the Fourier of the mass. I hope I didn't confuse you. So pictorially, it looks like that. The Fourier of the delta function is something which is very wide. This is the diffraction pattern of this spot. And you see light coming from one of these lasers, reaches all the other lasers with the same phase. OK? And if physicists know that all to all systems, it's easiest to synchronize. Remember, when you clap your hands, this is going to be all to all. And uh, indeed, we actually got our best results. Where are they? It's all to all. And we were able to lock maybe 5,000 lasers. This is the best we could do. Uh, and again, and how do I know how many lasers I lock? I compare this area to the original area, or if you want to the distance between these high order peaks. So no surprise here. Then we spoiled it a little bit. This is for you, Claudio. So, so we started to open this aperture. So when you open the aperture, the coupling function is just a Fourier of this aperture. And a Fourier of a circle, is this function, which is called gene or, or whatever. And what is nice about this function, it has two properties. First, it's long range. It decays as, as a polynom. And second, it oscillates at a frequency, spatial frequency, at a distance, which depends on this radius. And in particular, if you choose this oscillation frequency to be incommensurate with the lattice, we get something which is essentially random and long range. So it's not strictly a spin glass, but it's probably strongly related to a spin glass. And <laughs> it's hard to see from here. You see that I don't get a good phase locking. You see that these spots become loud. By the way, for the experts, I have to justify. I have to tell you why these spots are loud. It's not enough to tell you this, uh, uh, this is roughly this. You, you can guess where the circle is. This is the Fourier transform. And you see these spots are not so sharp. It means that I have only short range order. But you see, on the, on the field, is still within the aperture. So this is minimal loss. So why should the system create more order than to minimal loss? And, and that's the reason why it doesn't. And most technically, it not only minimizes loss, which if you remember, our loss is sort of an analog to energy, but it also has to maximize entropy. So there's some kind of a, I don't know to call it a free energy, because it's a complex energy, but real entropy. It's like a sort of a free energy, which is really what our system minimizes. So whenever I told you minimize loss, correct now. It's minimal loss under maximum entropy. And because there are so many near degenerate solutions, that's what creates these uh, strange patterns. Um, and we are highly interested in that, and we are working now to understand better these kind of systems. So even with this really, really simple system, you know, just an aperture and a cavity, you can already get rather exotic states. No vector matrix. And very efficient. Everything that I showed you here is more than 90% efficient. The coupling. And At some point, we got tired from this oscillation. <laughs> so we asked, what, fun, what coupling function never oscillates? And I don't know if you know, only one. There's only one, Gaussian. There's the only one which is allowed to be lo not to oscillate. And how do, how do I make a Gaussian coupling? I put a Gaussian filter there. So we bought it from Torlabs. It burned. We bought another one. Now it works. So we have a, cup, a Gaussian coupling. We can control it, the, the range, but it's always positive. So no matter what the range is, we always get this in phase. We could even take this random array of laser, which we call a liquid, lock it in phase, and get this famous sort of liquid order. But this is nonsense, not not. <laughs> but, um, so this short range coupling, the long range coupling, let's show the third one. And, and that's it. OK? So I'll tell you a secret. This aligning this little hole was not so easy <laughs> because it has to, everything has to be like a diffraction in it. And at some point, the student got tired. And he said, what if I don't put a hole? What if I, if I put this little plastic? It's called saturated blobber. It's a nonlinear material. It costs $1. And it has the property that it becomes transparent, more and more transparent as the intensity of light hitting it becomes stronger. They are used, for example, to lock the frequency modes of lasers. Why? Because when you lock frequency modes, you get ultra short pulses, and they less absorb. And this is another minimal loss example related to what we do in the time domain. So will this work? Now we have this plastic here. 
If by some magic all the phases of all the lasers will be the same, they will make this sharp spot. This sharp spot will dig a hole, a transmission hole. In some cases, actually, <laughs> it burns. <laughs> but let's say just temporarily it, it, it dig a hole, and this will be the minimal loss solution. Okay? So we tried it, and it worked. Where is it? Not as good, by the way, but it did work. And we got this in phase solution. But then we repeated the experiment many times, and guess what? Sometimes we go this, sometimes we go this. If you make the exact calculation, you have to know what is the nonlinear transmission function. We don't know it, so we just guess. You see that they are more or less degenerate, these two solutions. Here we have one large peak, and here we have four smaller peaks. This is the in phase, this is the out of phase. So we created a system where the in phase and the out of phase are nearly degenerate. And the laser chooses either this one or this one. Never a combination. Never a combination. And there's an interesting answer, which I don't have time to explain why. Let me just mention that in, each, in our laser, we have about 1,000 frequencies, which I never told you about. So actually, every picture that I showed you was an ensemble average of 1,000 independent experiments. That's why, for example, the diffraction patterns never had speckles. You should have asked, because it was averaging over statistically identical, but different realizations. We're actually sampling this phase space. And in this case, either all the thousand solvers give you this, or all the thousand solvers give you this. Never a superposition. And by the way, in terms of optics, it makes sense. Because if I have a superposition, now I have nine spots. Nine spots means that the intensity is distributed to more spots. It's less intense, it's more lossy. So in terms of minimizing loss, as we are always using, it makes sense. In terms of coupling between the solvers, it has to do with the temporal dynamics of the satellite absorber, which I don't want to enter. But now you are tempted to ask the following question. So I build the solver. We know the solver is not perfect. It makes error. So if I change like these two degeneracies, it, there will be some widths going from the right one at 100% to the other at 100%. And we have some norm that we can change to change the exact degeneracy. So when they are exactly degenerate, it will be 50%. When this is more, less lossy, it will be 100%. And, and then it will have a slope. If I have many solvers that have to find the same answer, will they solve better? If I ask you a question, and each one writes the answer and shows it to me, we'll have some statistical distribution. If I let you interact and discuss, you'll probably come up with a better answer. OK? Should we do that? <laughs> OK, so we did it. This is the linear coupling, where the, these solvers are not coupled. And you can see this is a zoom out. This parameter changes the degeneracy between the two solutions. This is the Hilda degenerate. And you can see this tells you how sensitive it is. And when you go to this nonlinear coupling, where all the solvers have to give the same answer, they can still make a mistake, but much less so. So this nonlinearity, in this particular case, coupled solvers, I, I call them solvers, but you, you, you know what I'm talking about, just finding the, one, the, the correct ground state between the two solutions. Still not easy. OK. So um, remember all these holes that we dig all the time? We actually dig them. We have like a driller. And uh, you know, it takes some time to drill. And remember this random uh, that I showed you? We actually tried to do a quasi-crystal. <laughs> but it turned out like that, so we call it random. So at some point, we got tired of drilling holes. And we put, we release and we put a special light modulator inside the laser cavity. This is an expect, uh, you know, Hamamatsu gets $20,000 for this. And then after a month, we burn it. We buy another one. So finally, we learned how not to burn it too often. And now we have digital control inside the laser cavity, which is just fantastic. For example, now we can make a real quasi crystal <laughs> because we can just lay, uh, ask this to be a, an amplitude mass. And we can look on these 10 diffraction peaks. And since we already paid for the SLM, we can ask it not just to control the amplitude of the field and the shape of the laser, we can also ask it to correct the phase. So this is called adaptive optics. Of course, this is not new. Everybody knows to do adaptive optics. But we do adaptive optics inside the laser cavity with lambda over 1,000 resolution of the gray level of the pixel of the SLM. So no matter how well we align the system, it's never perfect and always there's a competition between the students aligning the system, and then me coming pressing the, the, this uh, algorithm, and I always win. <laughs> now we have a more well-controlled system. And why is it important? 
because this order, as I'll show you in a moment, is very, very important when you try to look on, on, on this thing. Actually, let me show you now. Okay. So what did we do? We corrected the phase to be as flat as possible to compensate on all the known aberrations, you see, of the, of the lenses, alignment, and everything. And now that we have a perfect phase, we spoil it. How? Again, with the SLM. So we write this random pattern of the SLM, and we can control the RMS of the noise, and we can ask what happens in a quantitative way. If you remember the mapping to the spins, so this was the original Koromoto model, and now I'm adding this. Each one of the lasers have a different oscillation frequency. Here it is. And, and for XY spins uh, interacting, uh, this would mean that each one of the XY spins has a different value of the magnetic field. With some disorder, and we can control this disorder. We introduce, say, a uniform distribution or Gaussian or whatever, and control the width of the distribution, and look what happens to phase locking. And this is typically what we see. When we don't put anything, we get good phase locking. We get long range order. And as we put more and more disorder in the system, this thing starts to widen. Until this is about pi over 5 is 2 pi over 20. It's lambda over 20. And because it's back and forth, it's actually lambda over 40. So that's enough to deal with phase locking. Phase locking is sensitive. And we take some parameter that tells you what is the width of the peak, like coherence. This is the, called the inverse participation ratio. And you see that it goes down with disorder. And then we do the same with the long range coupling. And theory predicts it will behave differently. Theory predicts we'll have here a crossover. And here we have a second order phase transition. Do we? I cannot claim. In the stimulations, I do. <laughs> OK. But there, is, there seems to be a different dependence to the disorder of phase locked array, depending on the, on the range of the coupling. And there's, as I said, many, many very clever people looked on them. But we were sort of intrigued by this guy, Arecci. We were in Italy, so <laughs> we should tribute Arecci. And Arecci had a lot of calculations with second order, and then has this thing. This is, again, no matter what it is exactly, some pro coherent property of the laser as a function of disorder. And suddenly you see this jump. It looks sort of like first order, not second order. Where does it come from? So we read Arecci paper. And it turned out that Arecci also noticed this was done for lasers that uh, assuming the mapping to the XY is not exact when you have too much disorder, just like we showed you before. So the assumption of constant intensity breaks. And this breaking can give you first order transition, which is dramatically different. So it's not like a correction or a perturbation. And this reminded us this beautiful phenomenon, which let me share with you, which is called Millennium Bridge. Let me see the next slide. So this is the Millennium Bridge in London. It's called Millennium. It was inaugurated in Millennium. There was this huge embarrassment that people started walking on it. Let's see if I can, I can walk. Well, it takes a while, but at some point, <laughs> they, they, they had to close it. They had to renovate it. You know, it was a big embarrassment for the British uh, Kingdom. Um, but some physicists said, wow, this is cool. And they actually did an experiment. So they closed it down for three months. They brought volunteers. And they start putting more and more people on the bridge. And they saw something which, you know, as much as you can say with people, looks like a phase transition. So as the number of people walking on the bridge cause some critical number, the bridge starts to wobble. And you can understand why. Because people synchronize, mediated by the bridge, just, just like we saw with the oscillators. OK? And OK, enough of that. So we build a simulator for the Millennium Bridge experiment in the following way. Now you already know the system quite well. These are, uh, this is the mess with many lasers. Each laser is a pedestrian walking on the bridge, and they are uncoupled. And here we have another laser. We call it the bridge laser. And it's coupled to all the pedestrians. Now the pedestrians are coupled, mediated by the bridge. And we did it all to all with a small aperture. We looked what happens. And we control the number of pedestrians just by an aperture. This is an example where we have 42 pedestrians and 45 pedestrians. And we change nothing else. And lo and behold, this is what we see. We see a very sharp transition to synchronization as we increase the number of lasers, changing nothing else. OK, here there's almost no phase locking, maybe just a little one. And when we quantify this, as we did before, 
So we look, the, we look on the signal to background or some other parameter, as a function of the number of lasers, you see this jump. And this jump is first order, not second order. And in this jump, you get synchronization. And this, in our case, the, this, the bridge laser starts to wobble, and then it starts to oscillate. Okay, so is this mapped well to the XY? Absolutely not, but no, we don't work for XY. We work for physics, so we are actually happy. Um, and we found a critical value, and we repeated it um, for different coupling strengths. So we got this universality curve, and we actually got a critical exponent, and we actually compared it to a theory done by Raj Roy and, uh, what's his name? The other guy, Edot, who was also in the original Millennium Bridge paper, and we got it right. Um, so let me, let me take a five second break for me. <laughs> and I'll just show you like some recent results. Okay, so I, I think the story is more or less ended and uh, you can like nap. Uh, but th this is far from all. There's so many tools here. There's so many possibilities. So I'll just like, like show you a little bit of them in this. Uh, and, and the first one I sort of hinted. So I, I go back now, remember we were 1,000, 5,000, and now we go back to two. So finding something new to do with two lasers, puppet lasers is not so easy, but we said let's try anyway, because now that's a system we can understand. And to make it rich, first we can control, you see the coupling between them? So now we have a phase to the coupling. Remember I showed you that we can control the phase of the coupling. It can be plus one, which is real. It can be minus one, which is also real, but it can be completely, uh, I'll finish. Two minutes. Oh, no, no, it's all right. If you start with okay. somebody. Okay. Somebody wants to. <laughs> okay. So, 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 the, so the company will be complex, which already means that our system is sort of non-emission. Okay. But we, we don't stop there. And to each one of the lasers, we put what we call a complex potential. So it's an on-site complex potential. What is potential for lasers? The real part is frequency, and the imaginary part is loss of gain. That's why it's complex. Okay, so now we have all these degree of freedom we can play with, and at least we start with linearizing the system, as you know, everyone does. And let me just remind you, this is the coupling. I hope you can hear some of what I say. So this is the coupling and it's complex. We can control it. The point is that we can control everything accurately. With the special light modulator, at lambda divided by 1,000 accuracy. Okay, that's the point. But qualitatively, you know, it's not enough. Uh, and these are the complex potentials. So we change the, the frequency of each laser, as I already showed you before with disorder, but now we can change the loss of each laser because the spatial light modulator can affect everything. It's a complex mess. Okay? And so what I'm showing you the first, I, I, I won't go overall. It's just too much. But let's start with the dissipative coupling, which is it. The, the angle is zero pi. So this we already know. And what you see, the color code is how well is phase locking? How well is the synchronization of the phases? Red is good and black is bad. And what I'm showing you here is first, I'm not changing the loss between them. So they are identical laser and I'm changing the frequency between them in the horizontal axis. And you can see when the frequency between them is zero, when they're identical in frequency, they phase lock. And when I introduce a detuning between them, they go out of phase, which is a well-known phenomenon quantitatively also. So we can compare it to theory and Koromuto knows it, everybody knows it. Oscillators synchronize when, when they're identical. When they're not identical, it's hard to synchronize. You have to couple them stronger and stronger and stronger. So this is when known. But now we're tempted. We can do, let's go out. Let's make them non-identical. And we do that and we get this smile. So what is, what is the smile? The smile means that if one laser is more lossy than the other, it's actually easier to synchronize them which is, you know, sort of amazing. So you would imagine that two creatures would synchronize, or maybe not, you know, if you want to synchronize with somebody and you're so strong, you hold this big stick and he has to do what you say, <laughs> then, then you'll do the same. But if you're equal and you start to argue, uh, it's a little bit more difficult. So, so this is the smile. And, uh, and already we can do better synchronization by having the lasers not identical, okay? Here's something even more surprising. So here we go to the purely dispersive coupling. And when I say purely dispersive, I mean that the, the, 
it's, 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 it's unitary. There's no loss in the system. And the accuracy by which I do pi over 2, 90 degrees, is astounding. Okay? If it was not, I would get a tiny amount of dissipative, and I could say, oh, maybe the dissipative is locking them. So identical uh, oscillators, which are dispersively coupled, should not synchronize. Should not synchronize. And indeed, this black spot here in the center, when they are dead identical, we have no synchronization. When we make them unidentical in frequency, still no synchronization. When we make them unidentical, so that's frequency. In loss, still not synchronized. But if we make them unidentical in both frequency and loss, they synchronize with purely dispersive coupling, which is sort of takes a while to understand, and I won't do it here. I'm just trying to give you like the connection between our tools and, and, and what you can learn about synchronization. It was two lasers. This was never seen. Synchronizing identical oscillators is purely, and purely again is 10 to minus 2, purely imaginary or, or dis dispersive coupling. And then, of course, if you do both of them, you could do in the middle, and in the middle there's like a big thing uh, about the symmetry of the system. Uh, I, I want to go into that. I'll just tell you that in this non-Hermitian physics, people found this uh, PT symmetries, and it's extremely interesting. So PT symmetries, of course, studies work for without a, 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 for unitary and for sort of this symmetric uh, gain loss. And then there was this extension to anti-PT, and this turns out to have this anionic PT symmetry. Okay, so two lasers can already give you some sort of cool stuff. Uh, I have a slide on three lasers. <laughs> what, what happens in three lasers? And let me just tell you, of course, chirality emerges and breakdown of optical reciprocity, but I don't want to take all your attention, so uh, I'll skip that. This is called complex bands. Of course, the bands are now complex. We did go to many lasers, but allow me to skip that. Let me just say that we are now laser at the Dirac point of a honeycomb lattice. And when you laser at the Dirac point, you have several, uh, to do that, you need to tune the minimal loss solution to the Dirac point. You, make, you have to make sure the distortions you apply do not kill the Dirac point, because it's sort of fragile, right? It emerges from this uh, uh, symmetry. So it's, you, you, can, you cannot rely on accidental symmetries. You have to go to this. So I was told by the theorists that explain that. Anyway, so, so this is an, an, an interesting system. Um, let me end with one slide about topology, because of course that's where everything is going for. And uh, topology can be very simple. <laughs> let's put our lasers on a ring. Here it is. And let's tell them to phase lock with positive coupling. They fail. Why do they fail? Because they start with a random phase distribution. And these local minima that, that I was telling you about are topologically protected. For example, some of them are this discrete vortex state, which cannot be unwind locally, right? Because of these uh, um, periodic boundary conditions. And uh, what to do when you have a system which fails inherently, you do something which is called Kibel Zurich. You may have heard. Kibel Zurich means that as you cross a phase transition, not infinitely slow, you get a universal appearance of a uh, structure and defects, which are manifested as long range coherence. And people are doing that by taking system cooling system from the outside and having a hard time because you want to cool fast and uniform, which is almost contradiction in order to get uniform scaling. Actually, people talk about going to a spacecraft to, to do that, <laughs> or to the, um, because on Earth it's hard to have slow and uniform sort of hard for these kind of systems. There are beautiful works with called atoms and, and even and liquid crystals, but we have this advantage of the system cooling itself uniformly throughout. So finding the correct generic universality class is, is more clean in this system. And we did that. Okay. This is just a little riddle. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the ring is topologically protected when it's closed, so we open it. You see this? So, it's, so now the ring is open, so it's like a straight line. So it's not topologically protected. And when you look on this, uh, Parameter over there is a number of defects. So when it's zero, zero defect, it means it's open and closed, it, there, there, there are defects. But then what we do, we do it gradually. So we change this, what we call the weak link, gradually. And we ask ourselves, when will the system know when it's open ring or closed ring? This is a bit confusing because we always thought that topology is robust. You know, ring, open, closed. But actually, now I'm telling you that there is a topological transition between closed and open, and amazingly, it doesn't happen at zero. So there's some threshold value which depends on the size of the ring, where the ring suddenly knows that it's open or closed. Okay? 
So that's our small contribution to the field of topology. And yeah. of course, if you have a spin simulator, you want to introduce magnetic fields. You cannot because these are photons. They don't care about magnetic fields. So you have to do artificial gauge field. Of course, many was done by many clever people in the community, Hafezi and Moti Segev and many others. Uh, so topological photonics is really well known. More recently, people are interested in what is called dissipative topological photonic because dissipation, as I showed you, is, is different. So now we are into this game and we have our own method how to introduce artificial gauge fields. And this is just one example where we can control the flux through this string of lasers. And we can break chirality, as I told you. And these are just two recent papers by Moti Segev and by Elias uh, Mirandi to show you the topology is now entering this laser dissipative system. So we are part of this uh, race, hopefully <laughs> not last. Uh, and that's it. So uh, I just remind you that I showed you some examples of spin simulator. You can see this uh, in phase. You can see this uh, failure, this Tau of David for the Kagome. You can see the quasi crystal that now we can do because we don't have to drill holes. I showed you that we now understand now a little bit about topology. I showed you this cloud synchrony, which is definitely beyond the XY mapping and for good things. So we can see this phase order transition. And I didn't tell you about all sorts of other stuff that we do with mode, like finding reconstructing phases, imaging through scattering media, which is a work originally done with Ori. Yeah. And I also didn't tell you that we can couple not only lasers, but also violin players. <laughs> so I, I, I invite you to read this paper where we took 16 violin players, uh, coupled them with this uh, wire, so we have a coupling matrix, uh, and observed lots of the things that I showed you with lasers, like geometric frustration, spin glass uh, state, but also we found out, guess what? That humans are sometimes more clever than lasers and they can get away from local minima by sort of heuristic jumps. And just to give you an example, if uh, you take one of these local minima that uh, cannot be unwinded by local coupling, it turns out that one of these violent players is so frustrated, so the word frustration here is manifested, <laughs> you can see, so he just stops following. So essentially he cuts the connection. And the laser doesn't know how to do that. The laser doesn't know, let's just ignore. So getting this contradicting signal keeps the laser in this local minima. Whereas the human person, as, as we all know from our own experience, sometimes just, you know, breaks out of the cage. Uh, and we quantify that. So we have a very nice quantification of this escape mechanism from local minima. And uh, thank you for your attention. So when you consider this random case, you may parallel with this uh, glass uh, uh, speeds, spin glasses. Uh, they really uh, classically spin glasses approach, and they use also the same type of statistics for random lasers, you know, like this uh, Parisi uh, coherent number, like a big order parameter, which goes from zero to one, this release statistics. You didn't mention any of that, but your plots looked very much similar. So you just didn't talk about this. Do, do you use this machinery, which is actually very uh, applicable in this case in mind? Well, um, let me answer twice. Uh, first, we're very much interested in, in this thing, and we are actually, I, I, maybe I cheated a little bit when I told you that this uh, improvised uh, quasi-random uh, Hamiltonian uh, is the thing we're now using. So we are actually building a more controlled system where you can control the coupling various spin glass uh, Hamiltonians more carefully, including vector matrix, which is okay now because we can do it efficient for this specific random plus one minus. It's called sharing complete. It has the advantage that it has to some extent known analytic solution. So, so we, are, we are working on that. And at the moment, we don't have results, quantitative results that we are looking. Uh, we have ideas. Some of them actually come from one of the organizers, Claudio, who published a very nice paper about replica symmetry breaking in optics. So we're just reading them and trying to spin these ideas. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we have some technical problems. One of them, has to do with what I told you so far. I said, look, I have not one experiment, but a thousand experiments. 
uh, is it good or is it bad? <laughs> so sometimes it's good because it gives you this self-averaging and, and, and etc. But actually for spin glasses and all this replica idea is, is about, uh, maybe not everyone is expert, I'm definitely not an expert, is about different realizations. So if you want to study different realizations, we have to improve our system so we can look on them one by one, which is something we are doing now. So you are supposed to a big deal, all you have to do is to put some ether on in the system and get a single frequency. That's what we thought, it turns out it's not so simple, uh, but this is work in progress. So the short answer is no, we don't have yet any results, which I think would be of interest to the thing glass community, but I hope you will. Very powerful machinery, and it, it just your plots look exactly like in the case. Okay. Even stronger. Natasha? Um, yeah, so, <coughs> okay, nice. Let me just maybe ask you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for it today. Yeah. So. so you mentioned how hard it is literally possible to make the amplitudes, to equilibrate the amplitudes to take the same value. But of course, if you do some kind of feedback, right, and ask each laser to adjust the intensity depending on the amplitude, then that would be very hard. But can you um, use maybe some layers of materials or maybe just the detector so that you, that doesn't uh, change the phase uh, of the light but equilibrates the, the amplitude intensity. But Just to you, have some way. I think you should tell me if I can do it because <laughs> I know you have these ideas. We haven't tried it yet. No, but so. experimentally. No, we haven't tried it. So if, if, we, if there's a scheme, we'll, 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 we'll be happy to try it. But what we tried is this algorithm where we, we had this feedback algorithm, it worked, as, as I briefly showed, it worked because we had a small system. So for five lasers, we could prove, experiment, well, I don't know what does it mean to prove experimentally, but we could validate experimentally that when the intensities became uniform, namely the lasers became non-uniform. I remind you, if the lasers are uniform, the intensity are not. So by making the lasers non-uniform with our spatial light modulator, we could get to a very high accuracy DXY solution, but only for five. And, and we didn't try it for a larger system, but apparently this would scale up badly. But is there a, a, another trick? There could be, there could be. I know in the phase locking, I don't want to, it's not a lecture about phase locking, but in the phase locking business, which is right, people want to shoot rockets with lasers and maybe the meteor that will come to destroy Earth, we have to bomb it with a laser. So this is important to, to combine coherently many, many lasers. And people have all sorts of clever ideas there, uh, more in the engineering department, so to say. Uh, and some of them have to do with, with what we are talking now, like what kind of degrees of freedom you use for the lasers, how to use nonlinearity in order to push the lasers to these more uniform positions. But they are talking in a very different language, so I cannot say that this relates to, to solvers too to making the mapping between the minimal loss solution of the laser. And, oh, I, I forgot to say maybe, there is a limit. If you go infinitely above threshold, alternatively, if you reduce the coupling strength to zero, which, you know, no experimentalist would do neither, the mapping becomes exact. But how to get there? So I have to get to this uh, high intensity, and on the way, I will, uh, bad things will happen. So it's not that the, the problem is that the mapping breaks close to the threshold where typically all these solvers make the decisions, if you remember. And then once you make the wrong decision, the you, you will be mapped correctly to one of these excited state of the XY. So I, I forgot to say that. But I, I think it's an, it's an open problem and it's a very important one. So I, I'd be very, very happy to get the ideas. Please. And your practice system also in a dynamic mode? So we can we cannot do anything else. So, <laughs> so our system is dynamic and it is spiking and, and the description of uniform intensity, I, I was sort of hiding all the intensity dynamics, but had I shown it to you, so you would all laugh when I tell you let's assume uniform intensity. Because you know when you turn on lasers and coupled lasers and there's chaotic and there's spiking. So it's, it's just a crazy system. So, so we cannot avoid it. And the, the question is, can we study anything interesting? So we had a collaboration with uh, Igor Rosenblum and Michael, Michael Rosenblum in Dukanter in bar -Ilan. There's a, It turns out there's an entire community that coupled diode lasers in order to do car synchronization. I don't know if you heard about that. 
and to produce random numbers and things like that. It's very important for defense. So suppose I have uh, two uh, lasers, one here, one in Israel, and somehow they are coupled and they are each chaotic and you have two identical copies of chaos. So then you can you know, encrypt and I could decrypt and if would not hear me. I think she could synchronize to us as well. I, I, I haven't seen a good argument why she could not, unless she doesn't have an identical laser. So it's not a mathematical system, but this synchronization of chaos, intensity of lasers, and of course other type of oscillators is an interesting field. The largest system I saw was three, <laughs> and we did thousand. So in some sense, I say, wow, we are so good. We did thousand, but I, I couldn't you know, find anything interesting to say. We did thousand because everything we do thousand. So if you find anything interesting about cow synchronization of a thousand oscillators rather than two or three, please let me know. Uh, but, uh, you know. But the, yeah, okay, the short answer is absolutely. The, all this intensity, which I sort of mentioned briefly, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. If I may, a couple of subjects might be crazy, might be out of touch, but at least I, I would encourage you to think about this. Two things. As you probably know, uh, the only scalable approach for quantum computing is based on Kitai states, topological states. We statistically basically non abelian names such uh, for the point of mathematics topology. If there is any way to mimic that, maybe it's fundamentally possible, because there is no yet a single physical system demonstrated demonstrated in five states. I mean, your system seems to be so rich, so flexible, so many uh, things to play with. Uh, idea number one, because you already played like this non permission physics, the idea number two is. You know, there are three solutions to Dirac's equations. Fermi 1, Majorana particle, is way more quasi particle. And again, with uh, structures like photonic crystals and so on, people have demonstrated already Majorana and wild type of behavior. It might be possible with your system to mimic uh, something similar. That also would be very cool and sexy stuff. Okay, I, I think in the. Okay, so the, 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 the two suggestions were to do some kind of a type like states. Maybe a classical analog to the type state, and to, to look on different classes of uh, topological states like my one or why. I think the second one would work with a warning. Uh, we all, of course, we always compare ourselves to these topological photonics people, uh, which don't work inside the laser cavity, and in and sometimes we envy them a lot <laughs> because they don't care about losses. So there, there's lots of schemes that they, they do where they have 99% loss, and who cares? You know, in the end, you put a sensitive detector, you come on with one watt, and you can do with 10 to the minus 15 efficiency. And in our case, as long as we want to stay lazy, we have to limit ourselves to total loss of, let's say, factor of five. That's the maximum gain that we can still work reliably. And this, unfortunately, you know, kills several, some of the cute ideas that we would like to steal from others, but not all. So that's one comment about the quantumness. So I actually, I talked with quite a lot of people in the context of this frustration. I heard these quantum people talk about the streaming. I asked them why it's so interesting for you. And they told me because the classical solution become completely invalid. And in some sense, it makes sense because even a quantum system would typically choose to work in a classical solution. Somehow it has the stability, but in this spin liquid, in this frustration, the classical solution uh, become so fragile, so the system has to be creative and find this highly entangled state. So I think this is the closest we get to this quantum picture. We are like helping them to better understand the breakdown of the classical picture, but what will happen next, we just, you know, like Moses, we stay <laughs> and look. And of course, there are claims in the community about quantum mess here. I, I, I'm sure everyone heard them, but I decided not to, not to raise them in this talk. So you, you, your core coefficient, is it under your control, this matrix of coupling? But can you change it on demand to, to do? Uh, OK, so I, as I showed, um, let, let me j just say again, I apologize, I'm repeating myself. There are two sort of approaches how to do coupling between many lasers. One of them, I call it vector matrix. It's just the most generic. You have 100 lasers. Each one is coupled to any other laser by 100 to 100 uh, a matrix of complex numbers with amplitude and phase. This I call vector matrix, and, and, and basically this is what Yamamoto is doing. I'll let with uh, electronics and not with photonics. Uh, this is what, as was mentioned, people work on photonics from the 80s. Um, we do it. 
but it's quite lossy. So, and, and this company, Light Solver, that I mentioned, is hard working on that. So let's hope they'll have a system we can all use. For, we are the cloud, right? First, you put things on the cloud. And so, so this, is, this is the long term. In the short term, we do physically motivated coupling. It's not generic. It's nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, you know, all, the, all these kind of things. And, of, and yes, we have quite a lot of control. There are some famous scaling arguments in optics. I, I don't want to bore you, but Dennis Gabor, who's one of my heroes, had some less well-known papers, other than inventing holography, about optical processing in the 40s and 50s. And he gave all these dimensionality arguments. For example, why do we say vector matrix? It's annoying. We, have a, we actually have matrices of emitters. Why do we only take a vector of a meter? Because you, if you, I want to connect, I know how to implement a, a matrix of, of optical interconnect, so I can only connect a vector to a vector. This is called vector matrix. So it's so annoying. Uh, you lose dimension, and losing dimension is a lot in optics. You know, take a 10 centimeter optics, so the number of degrees of freedom is 10 centimeters divided by micron. There's a big difference when you square this number. <laughs> between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 10 degrees of freedom. Where did we lose this 10 to the 5 degrees of freedom? And we lose them on this generality of the interconnect. So I, I believe that there's a lot of place in between. So the vector matrix will work, either by, uh, by this company or another company, or by Peter McMahon that works on that, but it will be limited to small systems. And quasi, uh, like a, a, an example that I discussed with Natasha, suppose you want just nearest neighbors, but random. So every, now you don't have n by n, you have 4 by n, or 6 by n, if you have triangular. We know how to do that. Actually, we did that. Uh, is it useful? How, does, uh, how can you map a, a general program to this problem? I'm not so sure. So you, you, we can do quasi-arbitrary things. We have, if, if, if we use some restriction, we do it well, without losses, with uh, many, many elements. We could do it for thousands of lasers. Simple answer to his question. I mean, the special light of the later, you should yeah, be able yeah. to control coupling. What, what I'm trying yeah, to say, how, 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 how will it scale? Sorry, Even though you have a million pixels. Yeah. Okay, uh, when we will be back? Just one comment, last comment. So uh, I think it's very natural platform for optical neural networks. So you need, you already add saturable absorber. If you add something like sigmoid, it will be very naturally. I fully agree. Okay. So okay. let's thanks again. Let's get back five minutes to oh. okay. yeah, think. Yeah, no, 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 sorry, sorry. And, and by the way, everybody interested in posters, how to start the project, and how to do And also, Shannon, for participating to the dinner yeah. more. But it's time to your things. Yeah, I like it. I see Lots for the poster, so we have to split. So someone will be doing the poster today, and the other the day after tomorrow. So let's let me sign your name. Yeah, I have two posters actually. Um, it's So two posters, and you are the other of both. And no, there's someone else. Send me another.
It's one. And the other one is. S A S. Yes. Okay. So we have three posters for today. Okay, thank you. So you can go downstairs and uh, touch your poster. Right? Okay, other names? Garcia. Uh, so number four. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. You said what? that we have 20 posters slots, right? Yes. I'm not sure if there will be given 20 posters. <laughs> no, I'm sure that we are we have room for no for all, so it's yeah. Uh, so assuming you are doing all this poster today. And we'll just bring it in the afternoon? Yes, yeah, you can spot the slots. As you go yeah, downstairs, yeah. you can see that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. My sweetheart. My love, how are you? That's good. Yeah, I just need to correct me. Yes, sir.